alarm about the greatest theft of taxpayer dollars in American history. The massive fraud perpetrated in the unemployment insurance program that skyrocketed with the COVID-19 pandemic. While many Americans who actually qualified for these benefits were left struggling to reclaim their benefits and their identity, upwards of tens of billions of taxpayer dollars have been stolen. The unemployment benefits passed in the CARES Act came at a time when millions of Americans were losing their jobs overnight as government shut down businesses and ordered people to stay at home. Livelihoods were ripped away. There's no question folks needed help, which is exactly why Congress should have protected this program and those who needed it against the criminals who exploited it to commit fraud. UI fraud is not a victimless crime. For example, a Utah woman lost her job after a cyber criminal stole her identity, bank account information, and weekly benefit check. Many more Americans have stories just like hers. Unemployment insurance meant to help them get through temporary joblessness was stolen. Their most sensitive information compromised by criminals while Democrats in Washington turned a blind eye. In addition to run-of-the-mill thieves, international crime rings took advantage of our national crisis. Law enforcement busted several rings that made off with millions, often using Americans as money mules to launder money offshore. The Biden administration's Department of Labor's Inspector General believes significant fraud played a role within its estimate, a new estimate, 191 billion in improper payments. The range of estimates alone is sufficient reason for today's hearing. ID.me, an identity verification company hired by many states, estimated at an astounding 400 billion, 400 billion in fraud. That suggests thieves may have stolen almost half of the 878 billion taxpayers spent on unemployment insurance. The White House itself acknowledged that tens of billions were made in improper payments. They estimate 104 billion lost. More recently, the Government Accountability Office released its own report, making an early estimate that at least 60 billion dollars went to criminals. In just one example of fraud, one example of fraud, one individual was able to file an unemployment claim in 29 different states and received over $500,000 in fraudulent benefits. With these varying estimates, it's clear that the Biden administration and Congress are in the dark about the size and scope of the greatest theft of taxpayer dollars in American history. The new Republican majority is turning on the lights. We tried when we were in the minority. As early as 2020, Republicans raised the alarm about fraud based on red flags from the Department of Labor's Inspector General and the Secret Service. As the evidence of fraud escalated, I'm sorry to say that Democrats continued to turn a blind eye. They ignored two requests from House Republicans on this committee to hold an oversight hearing just like the one today. Democrats blocked a congressional resolution to get answers about what the Department of Labor knew about funds going to international crime rings. <laughs> Democrats even voted to end the identity verification requirements and phase, phase outs of emergency UI programs they had previously supported in December of 2020. Republicans proposed amendments to protect taxpayers and those who needed to get unemployment benefits. Democrats rejected them outright. Instead, they unilaterally extended unemployment benefits in their so-called bailout bill. They did this even as most businesses had already reopened at a time when the Congressional Budget Office 
projected the economy to return to pre-pandemic levels of growth by the middle of 2021 and unemployment to steadily decline without any further stimulus spending. The Biden administration has been asleep at the will. In his, in his last State of the Union, the president bragged about appointing a chief pandemic prosecutor 14 months into his administration. That position has sat vacant for months. The Biden administration then changed the rules to make it easier for states to sweep potential cases of fraud under the rug. Those with their identity stolen weren't the only victims. Democrats' unrestrained COVID unemployment insurance programs fueled a labor shortage that punished American families and small businesses and denied individuals the paycheck and dignity that came from a job. Just two days ago, small business owners in West Virginia shared with this committee their struggle to find workers because Congress made a government check more valuable than a job. One of our highest responsibilities as legislators is to be good stewards of the American people's hard-earned tax dollars. This hearing is so important and sadly long overdue. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on exactly what the Biden administration is doing and what Congress should have done and must do to go after criminals and make right this multi-billion dollar wrong. I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Neal, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say a word of thanks to our witnesses today. So as Joe Friday might have said in a different age, just the facts, because that's what we intend to focus on this morning. On March 11th of 2020, Dr. Fauci gave his warning as to what was coming. Within three months, 20 million Americans had lost their jobs. That's the reality. Today, not only have all those jobs been returned, but just as importantly, there are still 11 million jobs that go unanswered every day in America. Just the facts. I know I helped write this legislation, and I didn't write it with just Speaker Pelosi. I wrote it with Secretary Mnuchin in the room over eight days. Much of this legislation was written by the previous administration. So just the facts, $849 billion of unemployment insurance. Of that number, it's estimated that 7.1% was fraudulently spent. We do not, on the Democratic side, defend fraud. We want the Justice Department, we want our witnesses today to pursue aggressively any of that criminal element that did what they did. But let us not conflate the need for unemployment insurance with what happened during the course of the pandemic. 12 million jobs have been created under President Biden, 517,000 last month, and the unemployment rate in America is now 3.4%. So the Paycheck Protection Program worked. The unemployment insurance program worked. The relief that we gave to hospitals where people were in the hallways on ventilators, it worked. So when I asked Secretary Paulson, a Republican who would, couldn't have been any more cooperative in helping us to devise the program, or when we asked Secretary Mnuchin, or when we asked Secretary Rubin, Secretary Yellen, and Secretary Liu as to how to proceed, they gave us the advice to get cash into the hands of the people at the bottom of the economic scale who really need it. So what did we do? We devised an initiative to make sure that the community bankers were in the middle of it because they had good credit histories with the people that needed the money. How about the idea of what we were able to do with the credit unions and CDFIs? What we did overwhelmingly worked. And to pick on people today of the 20 million who lost their jobs and to suggest that they stayed home during the pandemic, the number of women who have not come back to the workforce because they couldn't find childcare, those are the issues that the committee should be focused on this morning. Nobody condones fraud. We want those to be pursued who participated in the criminality that relates to fraud. But the idea that there's a massive number of people staying home because they can collect unemployment insurance, tell that to the members of the AFL-CIO and the trade unions that had to stop construction jobs during the course. Tell that to the hospital workers who came to work exhausted every single day to make sure that we got past the pandemic. If the reporters who cover the early stages of the pandemic, when they pointed out the issues, 
They said early on, oh, China's doing a great job. I don't think anybody who looked back in the last six months and played that China did a better job than the United States. Then we use the example of what a great job New Zealand was doing compared to the United States. The prime minister just stepped down last week, the approval rating 39%. We restored the jobs that were necessary in America. It should be a banner of success that we're celebrating this morning, Republican and Democrat. And just another key phrase here to point out, much of the unemployment insurance was passed out during the Trump administration. That's a fact. The idea, once again, that there's this group that's out there in America that doesn't want to work because they can secure unemployment benefits in Florida, $250 a week in unemployment insurance, that's nonsense. And the other part of this I think that's important, unemployment insurance is like a trampoline. You hit it on the downside and you bounce back up into the mainstream of the American economy. And that's precisely what's happened. So from our witnesses today, we hope that they will outline precisely what it is they are doing to secure charges of criminality, but understand in terms of proportionality what really happened here. Overwhelmingly, the American economy rebounded because of what we did, and much of it, by the way, came in this committee, and most of it unanimously. It was passed through the doors of this, this room. So I'm proud of what we did, and I hope the focus today is going to be on the role that unemployment insurance made in making sure that people could keep the lights on, turn the heat on, and make it to the grocery store to buy the sustenance of what they needed every single day. As I started, and we will conclude, just the facts this morning. Thank, thank you. you Mr. Thank you, Ranking Member. I will now introduce our witnesses. Uh, thank you all so much for taking your time out of your busy schedules for being here. Um, Gene Dodaro is the Comptroller General of the United States. Larry Turner is the Inspector General of the Department of Labor. And Mr. Michael Horowitz is chair of the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee and the Inspector General of the Department of Justice. Mr. Dodaro, you are recognized for your opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Neal, members of the committee. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about the uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance program during the pandemic. Uh, the program helped millions of Americans in need but there was widespread fraud that occurred. And I'd like to focus my opening remarks today on three reasons why I believe that happened. Number one, neither the Labor Department nor the states were prepared. In 2016, we worked with, this, with the Congress to pass the Fraud Reduction and Data Analytics Act. That was intended for federal agencies to be prepared to prevent fraud in the first place, which is the most effective way to deal with this issue. Uh, the Labor Department, like many federal agencies, were slow to implement these framework principles that GAO had outlined on best practices in the federal government. Therefore, they were not as prepared as they should have been before the pandemic. States had antiquated IT systems. Many of them had known this, some of them dating back decades. And also, right before the pandemic, the unemployment rate was very low. So the staffing levels of the state employment agencies were low. So they weren't as prepared either. We've made recommendations to the Labor Department. Uh, they haven't implemented those fully yet. They're beginning to work on them. Uh, but they need to fully implement our recommendations and be in accordance with the law. Secondly, uh, the urgent need to get the money out led to trade-offs that limited the ability of the government and the states to achieve the accountability and transparency objectives of the legislation Congress intended. This was due to allowing people to self-certify their result, their uh, eligibility for programs, eliminate or reduce the need for them to provide supporting documentation for their claims of eligibility, reducing the waiting time that was normally in place at the states before they provided the first unemployment check. Now, Congress rectified these issues in December 2020 when they passed the Consolidated Appropriations Act and then required uh, more documentation for eligibility determinations. The states started taking corrective measures, but this was too late. Hundred, hundreds of billions of dollars had already been spent. Uh, and while they're welcome and they need to be fully implemented, uh, and congressional oversights needed to make sure this happens, uh, they were not taken as, 
as early as possible in the, into this, um, uh, reduce the uh, susceptibility to fraud. You know, as a result of these trade-offs, self-certification in particular, uh, these programs were more susceptible to fraud than they would have been otherwise uh, during the program. Lastly, third, I would, there was an improper payment problem before the pandemic occurred in the unemployment insurance program. Uh, the rates often were in double digits in terms of uh, improper payments. These are payments that should not have been made or were made in the wrong amounts. Uh, and there was also fraud in the unemployment insurance program ahead of time as well. Both of these should have been harbingers to alert the Labor Department and the states that they needed to take stronger measures, particularly with the huge amount of claims that occurred during a period of time. Uh, as Ranking Member Neal mentioned, you know, millions of people became unemployed at the same time. This rarely has happened in our economy where so many people have applied for uninsurance and been out of jobs in, in the, almost every sector of the economy during this period of time. So more measures should have been taken. Now, I've, we've made recommendations uh, in many cases to have uh, this un underlying improper payment problem. And it doesn't happen just in the unemployment insurance program. It happens in Medicare, or Medicaid, and 86 different programs across the federal government's activities. But it was there, it should have been dealt with. And if we can't deal at the federal government and the state's level to reduce improper payments in normal times, then you're bound to have problems when there are emergencies. And there will be future emergencies. And so people need to get prepared. So I'd urge this committee to continue their oversight, to make sure the labor departments and the states take action uh, on our recommendations so that we're much better prepared next time to deal with these emergency situations. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'd be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Turner, you're now recognized. Oh, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Although the OIG oversees all DOL programs, my testimony today focuses on our oversight of the unemployment insurance program. The views expressed in my testimony are based on the independent work of the OIG and are not intended to reflect DOL's position. Mr. Chairman, the OIG remains committed to assisting DOL and Congress in improving the efficiency and integrity of the UI program. In our view, strengthening the program to prevent and detect fraud are key objectives to ensuring that unemployed workers quickly receive needed benefits while safeguarding taxpayer dollars. For many years, the OIG has highlighted significant concerns with DOL and state's ability to deploy UI benefits expeditiously and efficiently while ensuring integrity and adequate oversight. The pandemic compounded these challenges, They're creating the perfect storm. As the OIG reported, states were not prepared to process the historic volume of claims, resulting in significant delays. Initial reliance on claimant self-certification rendered the PUA program extremely susceptible to fraud, and the unprecedented infusion of federal funds gave fraudsters a high-value target to exploit. That combined with ease of identity theft and system weaknesses previously identified by the OIG allow criminals to defraud the program. DOL recently reported an annual improper payment rate of 21.52% for FY22. When applied to the approximate $888 billion in benefits paid during the pandemic, we estimate that at least $191 billion in pandemic UI payments could have been paid improperly, with a significant portion attributable to fraud. Indeed, following the passage of the CARES Act, fraud against the UI program exploded. Since April 1, 2020, the OIG opened more than 198,000 UI investigative matters. This represents 1,000 times the increase in the volume of our UI work. The OIG took immediate action to respond to this crisis. Less than a month after the CARES Act was passed, we issued an advisory report identifying initial areas of concern for DOL and the states to consider. Since then, we have released several additional reports. We also hired additional investigators, strengthened our data analytics program, 
and work with DOJ to create a national UI fraud task force. We leveraged our SIGI and PRAC resources, implemented outreach and education with the states, and collaborated with the PRAC, DOJ, and the Secret Service to recover fraudulent funds. We also engaged with international law enforcement partners to pursue transnational organized criminal groups. The OIG efforts have resulted in more than 700 search warrants executed and 1,200 individuals charged with UI fraud. These charges have resulted in more than 500 convictions, 11,000 months of incarceration, and $905 million in investigative results. We also identified $45.6 billion in potentially fraudulent UI benefits paid in five, four high-risk areas. In response to our recommendations, DOL instituted efforts to improve the UI program. However, several OIG recommendations remain unimplemented regarding OIG's access to UI data, state staffing and IT modernization, guidance and assistance to states, and controls for improper payments. Mr. Chairman, I want to take a moment to highlight three challenges impacting our work. First, is access to UI data. For many years, the OIG has requested access to data proactively to monitor the program. Given the magnitude of the issues we saw at the start of the pandemic, we took the unprecedented step of issuing IG subpoenas to all 50 states, territories, and jurisdictions. The data allowed the OIG to identify billions in potential fraud. However, the subpoena process took months and delayed our ability to detect fraud. Second, the statute of limitations associated with the pandemic UI fraud will start to expire in early 2025. UI crimes often include complex schemes and require significant resources and time to investigate. As such, we recommend last year that Congress extend the statute of limitations from five to 10 years. Third, our work has been impacted by resource limitations. The OIG received $38.5 million to oversee the close to one trillion uh, in expanded programs. However, most of the funding will be fully expanded, expended by FY24. Combined with lower than expected FY23 appropriations, our funding is not sufficient to maintain the level of oversight deployed during the pandemic. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your opportunity to, to testify about our over, overseeing the UI program. I also want to thank the dedicated OIG employees who work tirelessly to accomplish the oversight mission. I look forward to answering any questions you or members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Horowitz, you are now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. The PRAC was created by Congress to provide independent oversight of the approximately $5 trillion in pandemic relief spending and to help coordinate and support Inspector General oversight. Working with our local, state, and, inspect and federal oversight partners, including the Comptroller General and IG Turner, we're helping to reduce fraud in pandemic programs and hold accountable those who have stolen from them. We're also advancing transparency through our website, pandemicoversight.gov, by allowing the public to use interactive tools to see how their money is being spent. Indeed, on pandemicoversight.gov, the public can find a spotlight section detailing the over $800 billion on spent on pandemic unemployment insurance programs and includes an interactive map on state reporting of their program integrity. Uh, the PRAC raised concerns about pandemic unemployment insurance program integrity shortly after the first programs were adopted. In June 2020, we convened stakeholders in a virtual listening forum to hear from state workforce and unemployment agency leaders about the massive increase in UI claims, resulting in a strain on their systems and the need for greater federal state cooperation on data sharing. We've worked closely with our state and local counterparts on these issues, including providing them with regular briefings and fraud alerts. In December 2021, we issued a capstone report that can be found on our website that shares four common challenges that states faced in, man in managing the pandemic unemployment insurance programs. First, programs face severe staffing shortages as claims surged. Between March 14 and April 18, 2020, weekly unemployment claims increased from about 
225,000 to 5.3 million when the unemployment rate reached 15 percent, the highest recorded rate since 1948. Second, the claim surge exposed existing internal control weaknesses. Third, complex and varying fraud schemes increased as the amount of federal funding grew. Fourth, states experienced challenges verifying eligibility because of outdated IT systems and the mass influx of claims. Then last year, we surveyed state workforce agencies and re released a best practices report that can also be found on our website. Among the best practices that we believe should be replicated are increased use of cross-matching of data between state agencies, improved coordination between SWAs and state and federal law enforcement, local IGs and state auditors, more effective use of enterprise risk management, increased IT modernization efforts, and the use of advanced data analytics to build multi-layer fraud defenses, including identity verification tools. Indeed, the PRAC itself has developed an advanced data analytics platform to help us oversee pandemic spending. The sophisticated work of our data scientists has been instrumental in identifying improper payments and fraudulent activity. Just last week, we issued a fraud alert highlighting the use of over 69,000 questionable Social Security numbers to obtain $5.4 billion in pandemic loans and grants, as well as the importance of identi identity verification tools. We recently received pandemic UI data and will be using our analytics capabilities to search for potential fraud across these programs. We're also focusing on efforts to address identity theft, a huge problem that grew exponentially during the pandemic. In addition, we launched a fraud task force to enable us to better coordinate OIG investigations, including those involving UI fraud, to exchange information about fraud schemes, and to share resources. We also participate in the Justice Department's COVID-19 Fraud Enforcement Task Force and have detailed a PRAC analyst to work on the National Unemployment Insurance Fraud Task Force. Finally, I'd like to mention three legislative priorities for the PRAC. First, Congress should extend, as I.G. Turner mentioned, the statute of limitations from five to 10 years for pandemic-related unemployment insurance fraud, as the Congress did last year for PPP and EIDL fraud. Second, Congress should raise the jurisdictional amount in the Program, Remedy, in the Program Fraud Civil Remedies Act from $150,000 to $1 million so IGs can more effectively pursue lower dollar frauds. Finally, Congress should make permanent the PRAC's data analytics platform. We need, on behalf of the taxpayers, that sophisticated tool to prevent and detect fraud. Thank you for the committee's support, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now proceed to the, the question and answer session, and I'll begin first. Um, Mr. Dodaro, your agency released an estimate of at least $60 billion in UI fraud which I think we can all agree is, is scratching the surface of this problem. I know our committee, Congress, and surely the American people would appreciate GAO continuing to investigate with your resources and, and size and scope of, of the UI fraud, and you all have made such a commitment to do so. When should this committee expect to receive an updated and more expansive review of UI fraud from GAO? Yeah, for, first, I want to make clear that the $60 billion estimate, uh, as we've reported, is the low end, the low bond estimate. We're working on a higher end estimate right now. We should have something available uh, in, uh, later this summer uh, to discuss with the committee. We're taking two approaches. One, we're doing some modeling approaches, and we also might need to take a sample of transactions. Part of the problem has been there's been not even an improper payment rate yet for the pandemic unemployment insurance program, which we think and, the, uh, and others that has a higher level of susceptibility to fraud. So later this summer, we should have those estimates available. Okay. And will you commit to coming to this committee and requesting assistance should you have any challenges getting information from the Biden administration about UI fraud? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Horowitz, 
Last year, in his 2022 State of the Union address, President Biden announced the creation of a chief pandemic prosecutor to serve as director for COVID-19 fraud enforcement and to, to lead criminal and civil enforcement activities. The DOJ announced in March 2022 that Associate Deputy Attorney General Kevin Chambers would serve in that role. My understanding is, is Mr. Chambers left the role in December and the position is being temporarily filled by an acting director. We invited the acting director to this hearing, but he, he declined to show up. Um, besides the apparently vacant role, of the chief pandemic prosecutor, DOJ also runs the National Unemployment Insurance Fraud Task Force, but we have been unable to get the agency to share any updates on what the task force is doing. So what is the relationship between, and what coordination, if any, exists between the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, the DOJ's chief pandemic prosecutor, and the National Unemployment Insurance Fraud Task Force? So there's <clears throat> several um, interactions. First of all, we've been a member of the Justice Department's task force since it was created. We attend their regular meetings. We participate in the meetings with about 30 other law enforcement agencies um, to make sure we're coordinated and to make sure cases are handled um, as we and our IG partners are developing information. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we've also detailed one of our pandemic response accountability analysts to the task force that deals with national unemployment insurance fraud to support that effort. Um, and we're doing all we can with our resources, this is resources to support it. Um, I'd have to refer you to the Justice Department um, for comment about when they plan to fill the vacancy. Um, I do know that the deputy is the acting uh, chair of it. Okay. Since we, since we could not get them to, to come and testify, do you have any insight as to what DOJ is doing to identify and recover fraudulently paid unemployment benefits? Um, I, I do know from our work with them and my work as Justice Department Inspector General, as we refer cases to the prosecutors around the country, that they are moving forward with them. I think one of the challenges the department is having and prosecutors are having, frankly, is triaging them. Um, and uh, given the resources available and the surge in cases that you've heard about from IG Turner, um, as well as we know from the SBA IG on PPP and idle related fraud. So I think that's been one of the challenges. One of the reasons we've asked for an increase in the Program Fraud Civil Remedies Act jurisdictional amount is because of our concern that um, lower dollar frauds may not make it through that thicket for prosecution, and we at least want to make sure we can recover the money for the taxpayers. All right. Any insight into whether the Biden administration has any plan to appoint another chief pandemic prosecutor, given that the president's prominent announcement last year at the State of the Union, or was that just a talking point in 2022? As I sit here, they have not consulted me, and I wouldn't expect them to on their plans. I would expect that to happen, and I would be happy to get back to you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee with any data or information you need from, from them if you haven't received it. Appreciate all the information. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Nill, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Have. Chairman. So back to the facts. The unemployment rate, as Mr. Horowitz pointed out, in the height of the pandemic was 15.4%. As of last Friday, it was 3.4%. I think unemployment insurance worked. Let me give you another number with facts. $849 billion, $60 billion, we know it's an estimate, that's 7.1% that is alleged to be fraud at the moment. We have members of the former U.S. Attorney's offices here. They know how long it takes to present these cases. So as professional as this testimony has been, and we're indeed grateful for it, I'm disappointed that we didn't hear from any of our hardworking people who relied upon unemployment insurance to keep their lives afloat. That from that perspective, we know that state administrators and workers, they dealt with a 3,000% increase in UI claims. That paints a much more complicated picture. Let me read a note from Meredith, a Mom Rising member from Western Massachusetts. UI with the stimulus has saved our family. It's something we never imagined we need, but we both worked as administrators in education, one of us for study abroad companies and another finding ourselves out of work for no fault of our own but the pandemic and having a young daughter. 
We're extremely mindful of every penny, and we are worried about the coming months not knowing when and if we'll secure jobs. But we want to pay our mortgages as we have and our car payments, our food, and our medical care. Please understand, we live modestly, more than most people will ever know, and have always been responsible financially. Our home is small and one of the least expensive in our town. This is the first time in our lives that we ever could imagine the possibility of not being able to pay for basic expenses. It is profoundly stressful. For now, at least you, I, with the stimulus, ensured that we were able to pay our mortgage, our car payments, our insurance, our food, and for essential family services. Mr. Turner, let me say how much I appreciate the work that you and your staff have done in trying to bring about criminal fraud rings to justice. Your work is putting criminals behind bars and returning the money they stole from the Treasury. Let me ask you about paying for the good work that you do. We provided immediate funding and support through the CARES Act and then ARPA, and I know that work is ongoing. You asked for $120 million from your office and received only $97 million in appropriation for fiscal 23. I'll ask you in a moment if that's correct. And last night, Joe Biden indicated that he intends to be assertive and aggressive with criminal referrals from the Justice Department. Certainly, the proposal that we've offered was then not what was agreed to in Congress in the final package. Mr. Turner, could you talk about the impact of your work and what members of this committee should be doing to support your goals? Well, one of the things that uh, we try to do with our work is to make sure that the funds uh, that were uh, going towards that program is actually being used and gets down to the correct uh, recipient. Uh, so for instance, uh, the uh, $888 billion uh, that goes towards uh, that program uh, our goal is always to make sure that we conduct audits, to make sure that it's getting there effectively and efficiently and in a timely way, and provide uh, oversight, independent oversight by our, uh, by our investigators to ensure that they can deter any kind of fraud that may be taking place. Uh, thank you, Mr. Turner. And, and I know that based upon the, U the Justice Department and what U.S. attorneys do, seldom does a would-be criminal or an individual who's suspect, if ever, walk into a U.S. attorney's office and say, hey, could you bring me up the date on what you're doing with me? That really doesn't happen, does it? Uh, no. Uh, it, it takes a lot of hard work on, on the part of our investigators to actually go out and find the culprits. And sophisticated criminal rings they clearly try to outsmart the system regularly, so it takes the Justice Department and the good work that U.S. attorneys' offices do across the country considerable time in breaking down this criminal activity. Is that correct? Yes. The more complex uh, fraud is, the harder it is to capture. For instance, I think someone mentioned earlier about Money Muse. Money Muse is one of the more complicated uh, uh, schemes that are out there, and so it takes some time and some investigative work to get to those, to get to the bottom those investigations. Thank you, Mr. Turner. June 2020, the unemployment rate, as Mr. Horowitz pointed out, was 15.4 percent. 20 million people had lost their jobs. The unemployment rate, as reported last Friday after the noting of all those jobs being created, is now 3.4 percent. Much of what we did really worked, and I take great professional and personal satisfaction from acknowledging there was no book on the shelf for what we were doing and overwhelmingly, we got the American economy back on its feet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the gentleman from Massachusetts, and I now recognize the vice chairman of the committee, Mr. Buchanan of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I'm glad we are finally focusing on this crisis, which has been a magnet for theft and a boodoggle for taxpayers' dollars. In total, GAO has found at least $60 billion stolen funds to DOL put the number as high as $191 billion in proper payments with a significant amount due to fraud. Outside experts estimate as high as $400 billion. So it's something we clearly need to focus on and figure out how to do it better. Uh, Mr. Dudaro, let me ask you, in Florida, I can tell you it was a disaster. There was so many dollars coming in. We weren't prepared. We had low unemployment rate at the time. We didn't have the capacity, didn't have the people, didn't have the equipment. It was like the F troop. Our office is getting hammered. Everybody was getting hammered in our state. What are, where are we at today if we have another crisis and we've got to be able to move dollars quickly? Because obviously nobody can imagine when you talk about 800 billion, no matter how you put it out there, we don't have that kind of capacity. 
and obviously it might not be that such a big number. Well, as a result of that, we end up with three or four hundred or two hundred, pick a number, and fraud uh, taxpayer money's out the door. So, give us your thought. What are we doing today to try to fix that so it's not as bad? And hopefully, states are getting additional money. They're going to invest some of the dollars, excess dollars they've got, to make sure that we can minimize this in the future. I think we're slightly better prepared, but not fully prepared for the next crisis. A number of our recommendations at the Labor Department have been uh, not fully implemented yet. I think states are trying to make improvements. There have been some improvements that have been made, but they've all been ad hoc. There hasn't been a systematic approach to doing this, led by the Labor Department in conjunction with the states, and I think that's needed. Now, to make sure that Congress continues to focus on this issue, you know, I added the unemployment insurance program to a list of high-risk areas that we keep for the Congress and the administration to focus on. There are 38 areas on the list now. I'm due to come up with an update across government soon. But I added the unemployment insurance area. There are problems also. Yeah, I only I got a couple other questions. Okay, go so ahead. Get back to you, Mr. Yeah. Morowitz. Let me mention in terms of organized crime uh, organizations outside the U.S. We've got obviously some in the U.S. You hear out of Africa and different parts. Uh, not just this ID and identity theft and everything else. Where is that at today? And the, the, my mind thought is, how much do you estimate and what can we get back? That's, well, you know, it's one thing in different states, but looking at Africa and different countries around the world, they're taking advantage of the circumstances as well. Yeah, Congressman, you're exactly right. We've one of the biggest challenges we have is following the fraud that occurred through overseas gang activity and, and, and fraudsters. Um, the Secret Service has reported um, that they've seen that occur through entities in Nigeria, China, Russia, other locations. That will be our biggest well, challenge. What is that dollar amount? Do you have an estimate or any thought of it, a range? I, I don't. And one of the reasons I don't, Congressman, is that's among the hardest fraud to find, to track, and figure out because it is through overseas networks. Um, it's a challenge. I was a former federal prosecutor. Um, the, the process by which getting that evidence is I've very challenging. I've got one more question for Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner, let me ask you, they claim 70% of businesses, if they could find workers, uh, they could do more business. That's the mindset, at least in Florida. I think I've heard that around the country. They can't get workers. Where are we at today in terms of getting people back to work? Because there are, you do hear, I've heard a lot of it where people say, well, I, I don't want to go back to work. I got another six, six weeks of my unemployment. But what's your sense of where we're at today on that? Uh, we have done some work in that area. And part of what we found out is that there have been instances of where people have not gone back to work. And we've uh, asked the department, which has put out a policy, to address that and have that information reported to the states when it occurs. Yeah, I just want you, I'll get you the survey, but 70% of companies, small business I focus on, primarily small, medium-sized businesses, claim they, if they had more workers, they could do more business. So it's, it's a great opportunity for them. So anything we can do to encourage people getting back to work, setting the incentives up properly, would be uh, really appreciated. Thank you, and I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman from Florida, and now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, three years ago, with this devastating COVID-19 pandemic, there were millions of Americans who found themselves not only in a public health emergency, but an economic emergency. Through no fault of their own, a sudden termination of their paycheck, they found themselves jobless and unable to meet basic needs. Almost overnight, it was a necessity to get access to unemployment insurance to save their families from collapse. Uh, I think it's very appropriate, uh, Mr. Chairman, that this committee exercise its oversight responsibilities to safeguard taxpayer dollars from thieves and fraudsters. Such fraud is hardly limited to the unemployment insurance program. Uh, indeed, I've never found a line item for waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal budget but I have found fraud uh, committed and challenged and prosecuted for everyone from defense contractors to pharmaceutical companies. Indeed, uh, this very week, the New York Times reported that three of the five largest Medicare Advantage insurance uh, companies uh, in the industry had been accused of fraud by the Justice Department. But what we don't need is selective interest in fraud that seems to be more focused on uh, the unemployment insurance program 
which is vital to our country and our families, uh, than about fraud which occurred in it. Indeed, that selective enforcement was apparent with the very first piece of legislation that our Republican colleagues offered this year. When they seem to have so little interest in fraud in our tax system that they enacted legislation to undermine law enforcement, even though it added $114 billion to our deficit. I believe that as we consider this program, we have to consider not only the way the program was administered, and it needed to be administered with less uh, misconduct, uh, but also the people that were helped by that program and the challenges that they face. An example is a fellow that my office helped in Austin, uh, Bill Tarabula. And Bill was a parking attendant in Austin, and when all the events shut down uh, at the uh, city facilities, uh, he lost his job. Uh, he contacted my office in March of 2020, and it wasn't until August of 2020 that we were finally able to get him the assistance that he needed. The administration of the program, and there's been focus on what the Department of Labor might have done better, uh, under the Trump administration and the Biden administration, but the administration of the program in Texas was a disaster. Uh, the program was understaffed. When it was apparent that the program was not up to the task, it failed to add staff. I had people that would set their alarms at two or three in the morning because they were told that was the only time they could get through to get unemployment benefits, and they couldn't get through. Uh, so it's not a surprise to me that Texas that failed so significantly to meet the needs of worthy people was not doing its job on the fraud side either. Uh, I believe uh, that, Mr. Dardero, you have outlined uh, things that could have occurred and, and have prevented some of this fraud because while the prosecution is important, it never gets back all the dollars that are lost uh, that should be avoided through prevention. Now, of the, the many steps that you recommended ought to happen uh, to prevent unemployment fraud in the, in the system at the Department of Labor, did the Trump administration implement any of them? Uh, not fully at all. In fact, yes. we did a survey across government and a labor department reported to us that they were familiar with the fraud framework, but they were not at a mature level. When we went in and looked, and did more detailed work, uh, we found they were way short of implementing best practices to prevent fraud. And in the Biden administration, I believe that not all of your recommendations have been fully implemented yet, but haven't there been a number of additional resources, additional dollars that were provided through the American Rescue uh, Act to try to see that we address this problem? And uh, in addition to acknowledging the funds that have been allocated, what do you feel is the most important step the Biden administration Department of Labor should take to try to see we never have this happen again? Yeah, Labor Department's put some guidance out, some tools that have been available. They've established an identity verification approach and provided some grants to states, but they haven't, all those have been ad hoc. There hasn't been a systematic approach. What we call for is designating a fraud entity full time. The focus on is do fraud risk profiles, develop an anti-fraud strategy, uh, and then to evaluate how well it's working and then continuously make improvements. The nature of fraud changes dramatically, and you need to stay abreast of what's going on. And we need to prevent this. As you point out, you, it, this is a cultural shift that we've been trying to advocate across government. Because it, when people think of fraud in the past, they think of the inspector generals or GAO or others to catch the crooks but you don't catch everybody and you don't certainly recover all the money. The only way to effectively deal with this is to prevent it up front. And when you have more technology available now to do cross matches, to use different tools that are available, you should be able to get the money out quickly, but also safeguard the federal fisc. Thank you very much. I want to thank the gentleman from Texas and now I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Uh, this is a very timely conversation uh, that uh, I, uh, I will say should have happened some time ago, but did not. But in February 2022, the Biden administration issued guidance allowing states to forego due diligence and fact-finding for large volumes of suspicious unemployment claims, potentially involving billions of fraudulently obtained taxpayer dollars. 
The guidance provides multiple loopholes for how states may apply blanket waivers of recovery of overpayments. For example, a state may accept without challenge that an individual who responded no to being unemployed, partially unemployed or unable or unavailable to work is entitled to a waiver of recovery of overpayments with no determination as to whether the individual was truthful in their response. This potentially allows those perpetrating fraud within the UI system to continue and leaves hundreds of thousands of unresolved claims involving stolen identities belonging to identity theft victims, including first responders, government personnel, and school employees. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a letter that Ways and Means Republicans sent to the Department of Labor on February 18, February 18th, 2022, nearly a year ago, requesting an immediate stay of the effective date of this guidance and an explanation of how the department would ensure the guidance would not undermine existing investigations. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. In their response to our letter, DOL said that the guidance was developed in response to requests from states which were, quote, seeking greater efficiencies in the use of limited government resources. States noted that it was taking a significant amount of time and resources to process waivers on a case-by-case -case basis for overpayments, end quote. DOL also responded that the guidance specifically instructed states that they may not waive overpayments due to fraud. This response was far from reassuring. In fact, DOL's response increased my concern regarding this waiver policy, which is still in place today, because it suggests that states were dealing with a backlog of suspicious claims, and DOL provided an easy opportunity for them to forego the investigation and fact-finding needed to know whether they were fraudulent in the first place. It further eliminated any incentive for states to track down fraud. This action is particularly reckless in light of White House estimates the federal and state UI program had a 22.2% improper payment rate for FY 2022. Mr. Turner, my question is for you. Uh, one of the questions we asked in our letter was whether DOL consulted with your office before issuing this guidance. Given the OIG's work on uh, ensuring uh, recovery of taxpayer dollars, I would like to understand how your work will continue now that this guidance is in place and in particular, any impact on your ability to initiate and conduct investigation and prosecution of fraudulent activity in pandemic unemployment programs. My understanding is that this is part of your revised pandemic oversight plan. Uh, thanks, Representative. Uh, let me just say uh, we do uh, plan on doing some work on FY23 to review uh, that policy. Was it a policy the department made? And as, uh, it was it a policy uh, that is a program programmatic decision, which we do not have any oversight of at that point, uh, because that was their decision as uh, independents. Uh, we uh, have oversight at the end of the day, but they did consult, they did not consult with us. They uh, made us aware that this, what they were doing with the policy. And so, uh, because we could not advise them, we did make it a point to take a look at that because we do believe that there's a possibility that fraud could take place. Uh, although they did tell us that they were going to put a waiver out, uh, and we expect to take a look uh, again before the year is out. Okay, thank you. And how many of uh, these waivers have been issued, and is DOL collecting the data at all, or is it just not ending up where it needs to go? Uh, at this point, we do not know how many waivers have been issued uh, as far as across the country, but that's why it, that work is so important as we take a closer look at it. And so, the, I mean, there, there's no way to know up until this point? Well, uh, we were asked to take a look at, I think, last FY, and we uh, decided to put that on our uh, audit plan this year. So uh, in the spring, we are going to take a look and find out just the extent of the problem. Okay, uh, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I, I hope that, you know, in, in light of the circumstances of COVID, and, and I think uh, well-intended efforts on the part of this committee and this administration, previous administration, everyone involved at the time, uh, that we can avoid the bad things that happened previously. I, I worry that after last night's speech, we're in a worse place, perhaps than ever before, in terms of what we need to do and what we need to accomplish, working together. Thank you, I yield back. Couldn't agree more, Mr. Uh, Representative. The taxpayers deserve that. Pleased to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here today and for the great work that you do in your public service. As was stated, started in March of 2020, the spread of COVID-19 crippled the global economy. We lost 22 million jobs in this country, 2.7 million of those from my home state of California. 22 million lives disrupted, 22 million individuals wondering how they're going to pay their bills or put food on the table as Mr. Neal's constituent uh, letter gave uh, credence to. In response, Congress acted in an unprecedented bipartisan manner to quickly deliver desperately needed relief to families, workers, and businesses across all of our communities. This included a temporary payment increase for unemployment benefits and emergency relief for small businesses, such as restaurants. It's estimated that these measures kept more than 5 million people out of poverty in 2020 and 6 million more in 2021. Because of what we did, our constituents were able to pay their rent, purchase groceries, and keep the lights on. And these dollars were spent locally, multiplying across the community, keeping businesses open. This support provided vital um, uh, support proved vital to our communities and foundational to our economic recovery. Because of our efforts, by July 2022, all jobs lost during the pandemic had been recovered. And just last Friday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that the unemployment rate is 3.4 percent, the lowest since 1969. Sadly, my Republican colleagues are using today's hearing to smear critical benefit uh, to American workers rather than propose any sort of agenda or idea on their own to address these issues. Fraud happened. No one is disputing that, and no one on this dais supports fraud. I think fraud is bad, and we should go after it in this case and in any other instance but my Republican colleagues seem more interested in disparaging the underlying program. Every single House Republican voted against the $2 million for states and federal agencies to fight fraud and recover those taxpayer dollars that we're talking about today. These are the very tools that enabled our witnesses today to do their good work. They're uh, to crack down on this fraud, it's important. Unfortunately, this sounds less about Republicans preventing fraud and more about them, as I said, disparaging a program that kept millions of families afloat and provided a powerful stimulus to our economic recovery. Mr. Dorado, during the pandemic, unemployment insurance gave 8,665,000 Californians, including thousands of my constituents, a critical lifeline by keeping them out of poverty until it was safe to return to the workforce. Uh, what do the dozens of high quality research studies GAO reviewed say about the effect that private, providing UI benefits during the pandemic had on our economic stability? Yeah, we, we looked at uh, 30 empirical studies that have been done and found that it, it was very helpful. The conclusion of the studies was it was very helpful for supporting the economy, keeping prob the problem from getting worse, uh, and actually providing a lot of assistance to individual people to, as has been mentioned, pay rent, health care, et cetera. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, you said something in your statement that uh, really caught my attention. You said it's your desire, your mission, your agency's efforts to hold accountable these people that defrauded our government and took this money. Um, I have yet to see many programs where private or public sector where fraud isn't um, in existence. And we, we see you can walk across the parking lot out here in the Capitol and see where the bricks that they put in when they remodeled don't match and are all chipped. I was at the border in El Paso last week and I saw where the contractor who built the wall didn't put cement in the iron uh, 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 pilings and they're able to cut right through them. Uh, are you gonna be able to hold these uh, fraudsters accountable and get back a lot of this money? Um, Congressman, uh, you're right. Uh, when you have programs, no matter what the program is, you're going to find fraud. There were several things with the various pandemic programs that exacerbated, like self-certification and, as we've talked about, lack of preparedness given what occurred, when it occurred, and how it occurred. 
Having said that, um, we're using every tool Congress has given us, and you've given us a number of important tools to go after fraud. We're going to use criminal tools. We're going to use civil tools, administrative tools, suspension and debarment. We're going to use all of those. Um, very important, though, that some of those be enhanced, as I mentioned, with the extension of the statute of limitations. I understand. Thank you for the work. Thank you for your answer, and good luck. Thank you. I want to thank the gentleman, and uh, please recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you all for being here today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, so this hearing is supposed to be about fraud. Uh, we can't do anything unless we get away from policy and talk about politics, because we always got to play this game about who struck John. In the meantime, hardworking American taxpayers are the ones that put all this money into this system that was stolen from me. Can any, any one of you, Mr. Mr. Dodaro from Manesson, Pennsylvania, the home of the Greyhounds, uh, can any of you tell me what the amount of the fraud is? Uh, we have estimated in the unemployment insurance area at the low end of the bond, $60 billion. We're working on a higher degree estimate. We're also trying to, and this has never been done before, do an estimate as to the total amount of fraud across the entire federal government. And we're working on that. Maybe later this year we'll have an estimate if we can have com comfort in it. So just the ballpark, you're saying 60 it's 60 billion at a minimum in just in the unemployment insurance okay. area. So it's you know, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon it gets really heavy. Uh, Mr. Turner, any, just give me an idea what the, the amount of fraud is. Uh, we've uh, estimated mm. it to be about 76 billion, and that's based on the latest data that we received from the department. Okay. Uh, the department had a uh, 8.5 as the fraud rate that they just released, uh, based on $888 billion for the program. So. Uh, we believe at the low end it's 76 billion. 76 billion. Yes. That's with a B. Okay. Mr. Horowitz. Uh, Congressman, what I've said before is with all of the investigations we have ongoing, mm -hmm. as well as the overseas work we still have to do, it's way too early for us to give an estimate. I've, what I've said is I'm it's in the tens of billions of dollars. You've heard these numbers. Yeah. It yeah. won't surprise me if it exceeds $100 billion. Mm -hmm. And as we go along over the next several years, we'll get a better sense of exactly the scope of the fraud. Okay. Well, the real intention, I think, of the meeting today, <clears throat> which our chairman pointed out, is we wait too long to look into what's happening with hardworking American taxpayers' money. Every bit of, every, all this fraud lands on the same shoulders that it always lands on, and that's our taxpayers. And I get so fed up to come into meetings where all we do is point fingers about who struck John and never come up with the answer to what the hell are we doing to fix this? Nobody in the private sector would run a business this way. And I am constantly baffled by the people who own this, why they are not outraged. I'm not blaming any of you for what you're doing. I think you get in here every day, Mr. Duero, I still wonder why are you spending so much of your life doing all this? You're dedicated to it, and I, know, I get that. But when we have these hearings, what the hell, we're talking about, we're up to our neck in alligators and we're trying to find out who was supposed to drain the swamp. In the meantime, this is being funded by people who get up every day, some working two jobs, and their wife helping out working another job to put food on the table and a roof over their head. We have so many huge problems with this business model, and we know that nobody in the private sector could possibly run a business like this because they can't borrow endlessly or they can't print it if they need it. This is an irresponsible model that continues to burn through hardworking taxpayers' pockets, and we're sitting about, is it a Democrat problem or is it a Republican problem? Damn it, it's an American problem. Mr. Dare, you wanted to? Yes. I continue to pursue my public service to be the taxpayer's friend. God love you. At, at GAO, we return $145 to every dollar spent on us over the last five years yeah. on average. Yeah. This is a problem regardless of the administration. In a few months, I'll be at work at GAO for 50 years. 
I've seen this problem over a period of time. Thank you. I hope to make it. Yeah, you're going to make it. You're, you're from right in the Pittsburgh area. But, We're but, tough. We're but I, I've, I have, and in my statement today, 10 legislative suggestions yep. for Congress. First of all, in any new program or increase in spending over $100 million, $100 million, it ought to be immediately susceptible to improper payments, given the problem we have. Right now, programs can be in operation two or three years and never estimate <clears throat> the amount of improper payments. This is, doesn't make sense, and some of these programs will fully expire before you even know early on. And I've got other legislative solutions, so there are things Congress can do to make this better. You, you know what? First of all, I've run out of time. Thank you for what you've done with your life. It's just incredible the service you've been to the American people. I would tell my colleagues, I don't care if you wear a red shirt or a blue shirt, start thinking about wearing red, white, and blue and stop pointing fingers at each other. I know I'm going beyond what, you're, what you've given me, Mr. Chairman, but if we don't stop what we're doing right now and look, let's fix the model instead of trying to figure out who it is that dropped the ball. You know, and we can't do it because every two years we come up for election and we gotta make sure that, uh, that we can still get that one more vote than who we're running against as opposed to, let's fix this damn thing. Okay, Mr. Dario, thank you. Mr. Turner, thank you. Mr. Horwitz, thank you for coming here and thank you for what you're doing. You guys are incredible. Thank you. Representative, when you were talking about uh, the hard-earned taxpayers and small business owners, it, it made me think of Ashley Bachman, our, uh, one of our witnesses at our hearing on Monday in West Virginia. She was asked the question, if you operated your business like Washington, what would happen? And Ms. Ashley Bachman said, we would have to close our doors down. And that's from a real small business owner and a real American. So yeah, based you know on your what? testimony, I, it made me think of that. Yeah, yeah thank you. But, but, but I am a small business owner. I, it's third generation. And uh, I remember one time we were talking about Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I made the comment that there was four times in my life that I didn't pay any taxes at all. And the rest of the committee looked at me and said, well, how the hell did you do that? I said, we lost money that year. That's right. So if you have a model that works, use it. But I really do. I'm imploring all of us. It's not about red and blue. It's not about R's and D's. It's about people who elected us to come here and act in their best interest. So I appreciate this. We have so much to look into and so much to get done because we are accountable to so many people who just fund this incredible model. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is an extraordinarily valuable hearing, an exercise to give us a sense of what the challenges are. And frankly, it has been an amazing reminder for me of what we were going through during that fraught period. I was going into my office at seven in the morning trying to deal with people who were desperate because they couldn't crack the unemployment system. And that, frankly, we, we all hands on deck for that. These people were in danger of losing their business, losing their homes. They were frantic that they couldn't get through. Uh, now, this was a state failure. The federal government gave money. Uh, Texas wasn't the only state. I heard this around the country. You probably had that experience in your office dealing with desperate people. And so this hearing helps us set the context and is a powerful reminder for me of what we were going through. Being overwhelmed by demands, a 3,000% a 3, increase in unemployment insurance claims, that's the reality that we were facing. On balance, I think I am appalled at the amount of fraud that occurred, but given the urgency trying to help desperate people, uh, I understand why we were there. The question is, how do we make sure that we're no longer there? Mr. Durrell, you, you mentioned that you gave recommendations to the previous administration and couldn't find in the midst of this that they were moving forward. I, I agree with Mr. Kelly. I'm not interested in pointing fingers one way or another, but I do think it is important that we don't lose track of the hard work of oversight, 
that we claw back every dime that we can and that we're prepared for the next contingency because it's coming. We know that and we can learn from those valuable lessons. I think it's important, however, to put some of these things in context. My friend, Mr. Kelly, wondered how the business model continues the way we're doing it. I'd like to offer one other area. There is six, there's $468 billion to $600 billion a year of taxes due and owing that we're not collecting. It's up to $7 trillion over the next 10 years. There's no business in your district that would sustain losses on that order of magnitude with the accounts receivable, with the accounts receivable. We know where that fraud, it's, it's fraud, cheating, breaking the law is. It's interesting that higher earners like partnership income, proprietorship income, rental income, non-compliance can reach 55%. Now, I hope that the indignation that we are expressing towards a program that was meant to save desperate people, that that can be transferred to an area of much greater loss. There are some people that think maybe we ought to threaten default on the national debt because they're concerned about deficit spending. This is up to $7 trillion. That's not new taxes. That's not cutting programs. It's collecting money that's due and payable to the federal government. And it's keeping faith with the hardworking majority of people who actually pay their taxes. So I hope that we keep this spirit of concern for oversight and economy and zero in on the people who cheated the federal government on unemployment insurance. But I hope there is still an era of indignation about the far greater source of lost revenues from primarily rich people who forget to declare their income. That is even more important. And this is an ongoing loss of revenue. $500, $600 billion a year that's lost. Mr. Kelly, we can't keep doing business if we're not collecting money that's due and payable. That's not keeping faith with small business people that you represent or I represent. So I hope we can make this a constructive effort on oversight, but that we have a broader sense of responsibility and reclaiming lost revenue. Thank you, I appreciate your indulgence. Thank you, Representative. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweiker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Turner, um, I appreciate reading over your testimony, but um, I could really use your help in, I, and I know there's unknowns here. So your number of either fraudulent or mispayments was, was that number, what I was seeing, $198 billion was the estimate? 191. Okay, 191. And if the program is about $800 billion, so your, your number is about 20% of all the payments that went out functionally got tagged in, in some fashion of either being a mispayment or being fraudulent. That's correct. Um, First off, how comfortable are you with that 198, or excuse me, 191, I want to make sure I quote you properly. Um, is it, what's the model in your head or from your researchers that say that number could be more? Well, or is it uh, less? I, I believe that's the low, we believe that's the low end. And we believe that number could be more because that does not include the PUA which dealt with the self-certification the first nine months. Okay, you beat, you beat me to my punchline, so you, see, you take away my shtick. Um, but there's where I want to go. What, what is their, uh, let, let's go on the way outside of the, the tail on the curve. Okay. What do they think it could be total? I have no way of uh, knowing that. Is I it know the potentially double? I have no way of knowing that. The department is planning on putting out the rate for the PUA uh, at, at the end of the year. Okay. And so um, that will give us a better understanding of what the number may look like. 
Um, you see, one of the things that angers me in, in our hearing right here, and, and we're all sinners here, is I never want this to happen again. And I wish we would have a much more detailed conversation of, okay, so we see a couple hundred billion dollars mispayments. We believe a substantial number of that is fraud, and, and the number could be substantially higher than that. How do you do it? At some point, and I'm going to ask for my inspector general, others, send me a little chart. Send me a booklet. Send me something so I can understand how is the fraud committed. I actually want to understand down to the mechanics. The syndicates that flooded when my wife, who was running a fairly large surgery center in Scottsdale, Arizona, was getting dozens every day of unemployment claims for people who had never worked at her surgery center was particularly interesting when she got an unemployment claim for herself when she's running the surgery center. She brought that home and thought that was actually, um, she wanted me to fix it and I'm just losing my mind because the numbers of folks we had calling us saying, I'm running a business and I'm getting unemployment claims dramatically more than the number of employees I've ever had. Is that buying data sets off the dark web? Is that the Office of Personnel Management um, data breaches, where did they get the first the data sets? Did they write bots that automatically kept filling out applications? Then when the checks went out, how did they get people to actually at those addresses collect the checks? How did they convert those checks to cash? How did that cash actually turn into um, Bitcoin or something else? How did it get offshore? Help us understand the mechanisms and the fraud. Because if we're going to stop it, I know we have two things. And forgive me for rambling a lot of coffee today. I understand much of what we look at. We need a revolution of the data. And this is the data from the IRS to this and that. We need to understand data is actually the solution. But I also want to understand how the criminal network stole billions and billions from our people. I mean, it, it, am I asking something? It's, it's too difficult. No, you're not. Uh, actually, it was a combination of a lot of things you mentioned, but it all mostly starts with uh, stolen identification. Uh, when uh, self-certification took place the first nine months, there was no kind of verification required to say that you deserve those, there was, uh, those payments. And that was part of the problem that the IG uh, uh, notified the department about, uh, because there, we, we sent an a, a alert memo out. Uh, we, sit, we also briefed the members. But, but, Ms. but Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, I'm less concerned about the bureaucracy telling this person, telling that person. I'm right now want to understand the mechanism. If, if I had my, my state unemployment offices and we had made it so they had access to commercial data sets, I mean, because commercial data sets out there know what type of ice cream I used to eat um, and my favorite flavor. How, you know, they have it, our ability to say, we're going to do red light, green light, bounce off types of data out there. Is it, is it our failure? To, to understand the technology that's all around us because we're still promoting archaic systems. But let me, but let me give a, a better example that would probably help clear this up. So for instance, stolen uh, social security numbers, a lot of times you can buy them on the, on the dark web for five cents. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is multi-state claims that have been filed. In one case, we had uh, an individual file in 42 different states and they're getting that money back in terms of debit cards. So it's cash to them. And that uh, is hard to kind of keep track of. And so over time, uh, when you start getting organized crime and street gangs involved in this, those numbers multiply. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patience with me. I think it would be fascinating either from oversight committee or full committee. I'd love to bring in some of the perpetrators of the crime, you know, who've been convicted. You know, I, 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 we've done it before. Bring them in, sit them in here, say, tell us how you stole billions of people's money. And we understand what the hell's really going out the, on in our neighborhoods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I, if I could just add one thing, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I give you an example how that took place. For instance, we identified 45.5, uh, 45.6 billion, million dollars, billion dollars, I'm sorry, and potential fraud. And it happened because they sold the social security number of deceased individuals, federal inmates, uh, multi-claims, and suspicious emails. And that, and that, and, and that was potentially what ha took place. We shared that information with the states Mr. Yep. Chairman, if I might ask for an indulgence. Very quickly. For years, I've been trying to get Congress to pass legislation to allow the Treasury Department to get the total death master file from the Social Security Administration. 
information. I was finally successful during the pandemic to do the data matching that should have been done beforehand to prevent people from deceased people from receiving payments and allowing people to exploit this. I'm still making a recommendation to expedite that because Congress gave three years before it became effective and it's only and it's only permanently in place. But you, you know, All I can, right, we I can to buy on. that data right now on my laptop. Mr. I mean, Schleicher. it exists right now. Yeah, I mean, not, the, not the complete one. On. Not right. the complete. Thank you very much. Let's recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, today's hearing on uh, the monumental and life-saving investments uh, we've made uh, during the pandemic is important. My friend from Arizona, could it, I agree with much of what he has said, but we are not going to throw out the program, it seems both sides are saying, in between words, uh, because there is fraud in the program. But you need to do something about it to get rid of the fraud. No one up here is advocating fraud, stealing, breaking the law. So we changed. We presented changes in the original program that we are talking about today. We know who voted for it, and we know who voted against it. Just remember that. I think Congress acted decisively and in a bipartisan way in the face of an historic crisis to keep America safe. Our unemployment, our aid kept families together and saved lives. That's a big deal. More than 1.5 million Garden Staters, New Jersey folks, received unemployment benefits from March 2020 to September 2021. It stopped mortgage defaults. It uh, kept electricity on, believe it or not. It put food on tables and in children's stomachs. In March 2021, we passed the American Rescue Plan. Where were we? Because the crisis continued. It included unemployment and strong enforcement protections. President Biden used those protections to prosecute frauds. You either voted for it or you voted against it or you didn't vote. States recovered nearly $100 million. Enforcement was working. Republicans claim to care about misuse. I agree. We should all. But every Republican Congress voted for the Trump Mnuchin plan that did not have fraud protections, and every Republican voted against our fraud protections. It's the record. You can't change that every other day or show us a different perspective of it. You either did it or you didn't do it. Our plan kept people alive. One of the most successful laws ever enacted. Last month, our economy added over a half a million jobs. Job growth is at a 40-year high. You've heard the chairman, uh, the ranking member say that many times. Unemployment is at the 54-year low, and the Biden economy isn't doing so bad. Every job lost during the pandemic was recovered. All our economic output lost is regained. Our pandemic measures exceeded expectations. We emerged stronger than any other country. You know, the, the problem of inflation did not happen. I want to announce this did not only happen in the United States of America. Thank you. I'm happy to work together to ensure federal dollars are spent and spent well. Frauds need to be held accountable and prosecuted. But this hearing isn't about fraud. This hearing is about shaming workers and lying about our strong economy. 
You didn't one moment last night choose to recognize that. The truth is our actions saved lives and saved the American people. And I say, Mr. Chairman, that this is a very good hearing because not only are we bringing some facts out today, both sides, but we go back into the history of the program we are talking about and looking at those facts. And I yield back to the chairman. I want to thank the gentleman. I want to remind the committee that this hearing is, is about fraud. It's clearly not about shaming any worker. Um, in fact, every dollar going to fraud is a dollar that did not go to those who needed it. And that is our responsibility as members of Congress to make sure that taxpayers' dollars are going to the right places and the right fort. So it's clearly about fraud. Please to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, witnesses. Um, I've heard repeatedly comments from my colleagues that no one here on the committee is advocating for fraud. I agree. I don't think fraud is acceptable to a single Democrat or Republican. But, the, but if we're going to talk about the facts, the fact is there was a trillion dollars still unspent from the previous COVID relief package that was bipartisan. There were several bipartisan relief packages that we worked on together. And the Democrats, my colleagues, went alone with $2 trillion. And the facts are we repeatedly, repeatedly warned them about not including guardrails, the ounce of prevention that would, that would be the cure for pounds, tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars in improper payments and fraud and waste and they did not heed, not a single amendment. I mean, we must have had hundreds of amendments. Not one amendment was taken. I understand their commitment and I understand the extenuating circumstances. And I quite frankly understand the need for speed and some of the mess that comes with that. But we were way down the road from needing to rush something when we had a trillion dollars still unspent and we had learned from the previous mistake of paying people too much where they were literally perversely incentivized to stay at home and off the payroll. That was a mistake, but it wasn't acknowledged. It wasn't included in our council. And I, that was a huge mistake. I, I, and there weren't guardrails so that we could get ahead of this on the front end. We knew there was a lot of money and we knew that with 150 some odd billion dollars in improper payments already, as has been discussed, this was going to be a disastrous waste of taxpayer money. That is poor stewardship. It just is. So there's a saying out that used to be on a sign outside of our former head football coach's office at Texas Tech, the great Mike Leach. And it said, you're either coaching it or allowing it to happen. It's a statement of accountability. You're either coaching it directly or you're indirectly allowing it to happen. So yeah, I don't think that you, any of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle advocate for fraud, but they allowed it to happen and they didn't take our common sense counsel because they wanted to jam a partisan bill, no matter how good their intentions were, through the process and uh, taxpayers have paid mightily. Were people helped? Sure. I'm certain there were. You can't throw a trillion dollars almost at a problem and not help somebody for heaven's sakes. That's not the question. The question is, are we acting as leaders of the greatest country in the world and as stewards on behalf of the greatest people in the world? The answer in this regard is no, we failed. I'm sure my party has had their shortcomings along the way, and I will try to readily concede when we do. That was a failure on your part. 
Let's not repeat it. For heaven's sakes, can't we agree on, on, on just that fact if we're concerned about facts? The facts are that we turned the trampoline into a trap and the safety net into a hammock because of these policies. I got 43 seconds. The debt is amassing at an alarming rate. A crisis related will be catastrophic. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, you know that as well as anybody on this dais. Um, we have to recoup this money. Every year I hear the same numbers. We got to get our arms around the 150 or the 160. In, in 2021, it's 280 billion, but nothing ever happens. What are we going to do to recoup America's hard earned money so that we can help reduce the spend, bend the debt curve and save this country from a much bigger crisis than what we've experienced even in the pandemic and, and maybe even any crisis to date. And I took all the time, but if he would just, uh, Chairman, if you'd indulge Mr. Dodaro just to make a quick response. Proceed, please. Uh, Congressman Harrington, I've said for a long time and written that the federal government's on an unsustainable long-term fiscal path. I recommended that we put a plan in place uh, to have guardrails, a debt to GDP ratio, some kind of uh, framework for guiding future decisions. Uh, I've also recommended changes to the, how we set the debt ceiling issue. I think it's that that was a better way to do it at the time revenue and expenditure decisions are made in the beginning that avoids a potential cliff crisis. I've also said that we have problems on both ends of revenue. As was mentioned earlier, we've got a tax gap exceeding $400 billion that's not coming in. It should be under current tax law. We're sending out 200 and some billion that shouldn't be sent out. And so we've got a lot of problems. We've got a lot of recommendations to deal with these issues. And I think these implementation issues of current policies can be done a lot better and more effectively to protect the taxpayers and to deal with our long-term deficit and debt issues. Thank you. Thank the representative. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I listened to my friend from Texas, I was reminded of a saying that the Panthers used to use, and that was you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Between February and May 2020, Illinois lost almost 1.8 million jobs, with over half a million workers left jobless in the Chicago area alone. Our swift bipartisan response to pass the CARES Act prevented unthinkable hardship for millions of people in Illinois and tens of millions across the nation. No one should get away with criminal fraud, which is why I was proud to help provide the Biden administration and the inspectors general with dedicated fraud fighting resources in the American Rescue Plan, resources that led to over 1,500 defendants being criminally charged and the recovery of billions of dollars. The actions of these criminals should not distract from the fact that pandemic unemployment insurance kept an estimated 5 million people a year from falling into poverty meant revenue and customers for businesses that were still open, allowed workers at high-risk COVID to stay safer during a pandemic that disproportionately killed black and brown people. My staff and I took thousands of calls from constituents who needed help. The Chicago economy relies a great deal on tourism, hospitality, and the arts, all of whose workers needed pandemic unemployment benefits to survive. I'm disappointed that we do not have the opportunity today to hear from workers who relied on UI during the pandemic. So let me just share a story from Bunny in Chicago, and here's what she said. 
We're a dual freelancer home in the theater TV industry with two children. We had to file unemployment for the first time in our lives. Our industry is shuttered for the foreseeable future with no end in sight. And with the huge unemployment rate, nobody has even called us for an interview, let alone a job offer. Without the extra boost, we'd be unable to cover the mortgage, pay our bills, our health insurance, which is all out of pocket, or keep our kids fed. I think we qualified for something paltry, like $500 a month in unemployment, which covers virtually nothing with the high cost of living in Chicago. I am deeply proud that the pandemic unemployment assistance provided relief during a crisis, and I reject this Republican concern for fraud when they remained silent when the Trump administration failed to implement GAO's anti-fraud recommendations and when they opposed the anti-fraud funding that this committee's Democrats secured. Mr. Dodardo, in the rescue plan, we put $2 billion in there to help states uh, by giving grants to them. Could you mention what this program actually does and what it did? Yeah. The program's intended to help with uh, combat fraud, also to look at ways to make sure there's equity in the program, uh, to deliver customer service, more timely payments. We also found some disparities in the amount of uh, payments that were going to different racial groups. Uh, and uh, we are, in our continuing ongoing work, going to be looking specifically at what the $2 billion was used for, and we'll be reporting to the committee. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your long tenure. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. In regards to the, the $2 billion that uh, the gentleman from Illinois just mentioned about, I actually asked my Department of Labor in, Mis in the state of Missouri to ask if it worked. And I'd like to submit for the record this letter that she, she presented. Uh, it says more, one of the lines in it says, more recent funding opportunities such as the Equity and Tiger Teams grants provided limited flexibility to address program integrity and ongoing fraud prevention strategies. Without objection, I'd like to put in the record. So ordered. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn. Mr. Chairman, thank you for hosting this important hearing. It's been a long time coming. Let me be clear that unemployment fraud is not a new issue. However, no one here can deny that since the start of the pandemic, the start of the pandemic, the number of fraudulent claims has skyrocketed. I know I'm not the only one here who has experienced this firsthand. Now, I first shared my story during a roundtable hosted last, na last year by my Republican colleagues on this very topic. From their lack of action, it is increasingly evident that the Democrats uh, my Democrat colleagues are still aren't grasping the scope of this issue, so let me show you. So this right here is a box, a uh, 27-pound box that I had my staff go dig out of uh, storage, had my folks back home dig out of storage, and it represents, from March 2020 to April 21, 789 fraudulent claims on an employee base of 324 employees that my family business had happened to them. Just 14 months. And yes, as, as the ranking member said, this was prior to the, the current administration. But that should make it all the more important of why we need to investigate the fraud that's going on across America. The American taxpayer does not care who's in the White House. They want to know where their taxpayer dollars went and did it go to not any Americans at all did it go to places like India and elsewhere around the world as we knew what went on. These 789 fraudulent claims were of people that never worked for me, ever. In 25 years of business, had never worked for me. And had we not done due diligence on every single claim, they would have been paid out. Now I will tell you, um, when you look at this, we also had people who had been continuing to work that got 1099 saying they were not working. 
And yet we still do not want to have an adult conversation about what really went on with hundreds of billions of dollars of fraud across this country in the UI program. And so when we talk about this, I really want to get to the idea and the thought that why we can't have and why we haven't had, I think some of you have mentioned this, that the closer we can do this, and, and I know that one of you all mentioned that we should have these conversations while we're doing the programs and recognize that when you're really just passing out hundreds of billions of dollars, some would argue trillions of dollars in the time that's happened to us in the last 24 to 30 months, that we have a propensity and when it's federally mandated that we're gonna have fraud. We should acknowledge that and we should do our job. It shouldn't be political, it should be bipartisan to sit down and talk about where this fraud is at. Now, I will tell you that uh, we know that this unemployment insurance system is deeply flawed. It's been around since 1935. People have figured out how to beat the system. It's happened, we see it. This is a testament to it. Anybody's more than welcome to look at you. Can't take pictures because it has social security numbers on it, but you can take a look at them and see what we're talking about. You know, when we look at the, um, the issue that we talked about with workers not working, it is a fact that we know that we sent out hundreds of billions of dollars in, in incentivizing people beyond the time when some states were going back to work with no discernible difference in the outcome of the COVID pandemic. And yet people in the state of Oklahoma were funding fraudulent claims in places like California and New York, and no offense to my friends, but that's where the, the largest amounts of, just from the sheer population, the fraud occurred. And I have to answer to my friends and my constituents back home in Oklahoma why it's okay that the United States Congress cannot hold a hearing on fraud and they have to continue to have their taxpayer dollars being paid out in fraudulent claims. Mr. Turner, what motivation do states have to mitigate fraud when the burden of loss falls on the federal government? Well, well first, uh, I think there is an incentive and part of what uh, the department is trying to do is uh, also offer up a policy of getting a 5% return uh, on when fraud is uh, pointed out and so and have that fraud return back. So I think that's part of the incentive I know the department is trying to do and we concur with that. That's been part of their recommendations because that would help them pursue it a little more vigorously. So, so in following up to that, what's, what's been uh, done to hold the most negligent states accountable so that the hardworking people of states like Oklahoma aren't paying the price? Well, I think uh, the department has uh, really reached out to all states and, and trying to hold them accountable. I mean, with our work, we really don't, it, we really don't care what state someone is, is in, uh, but when there's fraud that occurs and once it's identified, we work with our law enforcement partners uh, around the country to try to address it. Any, any reforms you see we should be doing uh, so that we don't have this happen again? Well, here's the biggest problem, in my opinion. The biggest problem is that as the OIG, we make a lot of recommendations. And if you look back over the history, even 10 years ago, some of the recommendations that came up this time are the same problems that went unaddressed, whether that be uh, antiquated uh, uh, IT systems or whether it be lack of staff training, those are things that we've identified. And with this new program that, that, that was out uh, with PUA, there were some uh, states that uh, the, the officers were not trained properly or didn't know. And in some cases, they waived that requirement uh, because there was a lack of understanding of how that process worked. I'd like to thank the witnesses. Uh, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. I'd like to recognize the gentle lady from the state of California, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to uh, the gentlemen on our panel. I wanna thank you for your testimony today. Um, how to stop fraud is a very important issue, but so equally important is how to provide help to families during a once in a century pandemic. Mr. Dodaro, did you receive unemployment insurance at any point through the pandemic? No, although I okay. would know for the record, someone filed a claim in my name. Okay, I'm just asking uh, and, if you did. The GAO The people. question was whether you yeah. did or not. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Mr. Turner, did you receive unemployment insurance at any point through the pandemic? No, I did not. Thank you. And Mr. Horowitz, did you receive unemployment insurance at any point during the pandemic? No, I did not. Thank you, gentlemen. I asked that question because it's increasingly apparent that this panel is missing a critical perspective. Someone who actually did receive unemployment insurance after losing their job. Republicans refuse to hear from working families who received this critical earned benefit when they had nowhere else to turn. 
Throughout 2020, my district office was inundated by constituents desperate for a helping hand. Many of them contacted my office as a last resort, saying they were about to forego food, rent, or their mortgage payments after losing their job. When my colleagues and I worked across the aisle to unanimously pass the CARES Act, we got pandemic relief out the door as fast as possible. Was it perfect? No. But we wanted and needed to help folks survive. And you know what? It worked. At the start of the pandemic, one of my constituents reached out to my office. She was an older woman who had just lost her job and was caring for her mother in hospice. Her UI benefits were the only source of income that allowed her to keep the heat on for her dying mother. Without this federal money, she, along with about 5 million more people, would be living below the federal poverty line. This critical lifeline also disproportionately helped older Americans, less educated workers, and black and brown workers. The point is that federal unemployment insurance during the pandemic was overall a major success. Again, was it perfect? No. But it kept families fed, it kept families housed, it allowed my constituent and her mother to continue living in dignity. We had to fact, act fast, and no, we were not always surgical in what we did, but we learned from our mistakes. But today, my Republican colleagues want to highlight the program's shortcomings, particularly fraud. After the passage of CARES, the GAO made several anti-fraud recommendations to the Trump administration. President Trump failed to implement any of these basic safeguards, placing American tax dollars at risk. My Democratic colleagues and I worked to address the criminal activity while recognizing the vulnerabilities in our state UI systems. The reality was that the agencies were chronically underfunded and understaffed. UI agency workers in my home state of California went from working eight-hour days to 14-hour days, seven days a week. Democrats worked to close that resource gap. Through the American Rescue Plan, we dedicated fraud-fighting resources while ensuring we were not harming critical benefits for American workers. As a result, the Biden administration has already prosecuted over 1,500 defendants who are accused of fraud. Again, not a single Republican voted in favor of these fraud-fighting provisions. Now they want to use the first hearing of this committee in power to talk about the problem that they initially refused to solve. We cannot discredit a critical earned benefit that one in four American workers legitimately needed in 2020. So let's not allow the action of criminal, criminals to distract us from the fact that pandemic UI saved millions of American families. And before I close, I would ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to enter into the record a letter from the American Federation of County, State, and Municipal Employees, which represents many of the dedicated state employees who worked overtime and more to pay workers UI benefits that they needed during the pandemic. They were not allowed to be heard at today's hearing, so I hope that all of my colleagues will read their letter and listen to the voices of the workers that they represent. With that objection? So Thank ordered. you, and I yield back. Thank you, Representative. I would also like to thank the representative for highlighting um, why uh, it is so necessary that we have numerous future oversight hearings to look at uh, how we can make sure the integrity of the programs this committee has jurisdiction over to continue to operate appropriately and fairly. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd just like to point out that this is in fact our second hearing that we've had, not our first. Um, and I think there were so many members on the other side that did not attend the first hearing that maybe they just slipped their mind. So I'll just point that out. I also want to address the, the insinuations that, that we have not, you know, that, we're, the, 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 that we are going after the individual citizen here. This, listen, this was a huge program. We sent out money. This place, D.C., decided to shut down the country and we knew we had to do something to help our fellow Americans, and we did. But then we went back to the well again when it was unneeded, and when we had an opportunity to put guardrails on it, we failed to do so. Now, I just think that's where we need, we need to recognize, and we need, we, we, we need 
our colleagues on the other side to get serious about the oversight and quit coming after Republicans when it's not right. So get that off my chest. <clears throat> Mr. Turner, in this program, I think you said $191 billion in, in estimated fraud. Is that right? That's correct. All right, and you've recovered 105 million of it? No, uh, I, I didn't say we had recovered 105. We actually, as far as the labor OIG, we have 905 million uh, that we have uh, uh, not recovered, but monetary results. 105 million, is that? Um, no, nine, 900. 905 million monetary results. And what that is, is there may be uh, court cases or admin or civil resolutions to mm -hmm. some of that. And okay. some of it takes time to actually see the, the funds. All right. Yes. So of, of those of those cases, um, what do you? How much do you anticipate recovering? What's a what's a good estimate? Do, do you have any idea of what that may what that may be? Uh, let me make sure I understand your uh, question. First of all, let me just clear. It's 191 billion that we say is improper payment, and there's 76 of that is. Uh, what is expected to be the, uh, the fraud rate. Okay, 76 is, yes. is fraud. Okay, I'm just trying to get make, make sure I've got the, the numbers right, all right on there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and you said you have exhausted all of the funds that Congress allocated to you for for those efforts. Did you did I hear you say that correctly? I, no, you didn't hear me say that, but we're on the verge of doing that. Uh, on, the 38 the, and a half uh, uh, million dollars that Labor OIG was uh, given as for oversight, yes, we are uh, close to exhausting those funds. Okay, so <clears throat> then there was another $2 billion that went for fraud pre prevention. Is that, am I, am I right on that number as well? And we- uh, I think you may be talking, are you talking about the $2 billion? Uh, let, let, me, let me refer that to two, $2 billion. Yeah, there was $2 billion that was given. It could be used for fraud. It could be used for customer service. It could be used uh, for these tiger teams that went in. So it was multiple uses, but okay. that, 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 that was that amount of money. All right. It, ju it just seems like the amount of money we're spending on that isn't, isn't getting a really good return on investment overall. Okay. If you look at the way I look at it. All right. So we got to be more efficient in that. Now we've talked an awful lot about fraud. Okay. And as we've said, all Republicans and Democrats up here, I think everybody in America, except the people committing the fraud, are against fraud. But there's a whole other part here, which is improper payments, okay? Now, we, we, we're, we've, been, we've been going after fraud, but we haven't really talked about the improper payments. And one of the things I would like to hear very briefly from you today about is the improper payments. How did that happen? Why did it happen? And has anybody been held accountable there? We talk about holding the criminals that committed fraud there, but what about the ineptness of a, of a bureaucracy that is just simply not doing its job in issuing out hundreds of billions of dollars in improper payments? Because again, improper payments, as the chairman said, a dollar that goes to the wrong spot is not a dollar going to the right spot. So in some regard, I don't know that we've got so much a Republican or a Democrat problem. I mean, we may have a bureaucrat problem because this has gone on for two, two administrations. So how does, how do the improper, what's the biggest problem with improper payments? How are you gonna fix it? And who's gonna, who's gonna be held accountable for that, Mr. Turner? Uh, so again, part of the, uh, let me just clear what improper payments are so everybody will be on the same page. Your improper payments is whenever a benefit is paid incorrectly. That could be the amount or uh, it could be overpayment, underpayment, or else it could be going to the wrong person. So that's the improper payment. And fraud is a subset of the improper payment. So I just want to make sure that I clear that up. Uh, and, and as far as uh, what we're doing, we're having uh, our audit work to take a look at that. I mean, we've uh, had 11 uh, audits that we've completed uh, throughout the uh, pandemic. We have another 17 that are ongoing, and we have three that are playing work. So we are taking a look at that, and that's how we're holding the department accountable. Can I? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm out of time, but if the chairman will grant Ms. Tower Woods a Can I just Briefly on that point, I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind, I know Mr. Dodaro speaks about this a lot, these are, we're really talking about 54 programs being managed by 50 states, the District of Columbia, and three territories. Uh, it's very important to include in this discussion National Association of State Workforce Agencies and state auditors, 
they're the ones on the front line because states are doing it differently across the country. Some are doing better than others. I think it's very important as we think about this program going forward, how much control should be at the federal level? How much should be decentralized as it largely is to the states? And, and how do we figure out what states are doing better than others and um, using that model to increase the, the compliance rates and, the, and reduce um, improper payments across the country? Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. And I also appreciate your attendance at both of our hearings this week, the first and today being the second. It was an honor and a pleasure, sir. Thank you. I would uh, love to recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so $5 trillion in pandemic relief was approved under two programs that included expanded unemployment and the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, both of these programs were signed into law by both Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, so, Mr. Dodaro, you've been a employee of the Government Accountability Office for almost 50 years. Yes. And you have been uh, Controller General for 13 years? Well, I'm working on that. And yeah. acting two years before that? That's correct. Okay. Next month, it'll be 15 years since I've been in the job. And as the Controller General of the United States and head of the U.S. Government Accountability Office, where is your, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a $5 trillion bureaucracy. Where is your focus primarily as head of that agency? Yeah, well, we focus on the entire full breadth of the federal government's responsibilities. Uh, you know, everything from IRS to the Defense Department, all the agencies. Now, we work closely with the Inspector General community to make sure that we're coordinating and making efficient use of our resources. How much time over the past um, 36 months, on a percentage basis, has been spent on waste, fraud, and abuse under those two programs, Paycheck Protection and uh, Extended expanded um, unemployment? Uh, we've issued at least 10 reports on those individual areas. We've spent a lot of time on a paycheck protection program, the economic injury disaster loan program, both at SBA. We've added that to our high risk list that I mentioned earlier, as well as the unemployment insurance. So I presume in your 50 years, you have never seen anything uh, of this magnitude as it relates to your office's responsibility to promote the integrity in the expenditures of those dollars? Uh, this has been the largest package in American history, rescue package in American history. I became acting controller general during the global financial crisis. So I was around for the $700 billion to unfreeze the credit markets, the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act before that Hurricane Katrina. This has been the largest uh, one ever. Okay, the unemployment uh, insurance program. So 2020 was $174 billion. Uh, 2021 was uh, $115 billion, and 2022 was $24 billion. How bad was the fraud and abuse relative to the benefit? I mean, can you formulate a cost-benefit analysis in your own head about, you know, a lot of money went out. Certainly fraud is something that right. neither party is supportive of and is very intent on eliminating to the extent that it's possible. So yeah, the way, the way, the way I look at it from an oversight standpoint uh, is that there was great benefit to all these programs, uh, but there could have been even greater benefit had we stopped the improper payment and fraud area, particularly in the loan programs, because there's only a certain amount of money. Yeah. So that, that other people were denied the loans. They were denied assistance. Right. In the unemployment area, everybody that was legitimately there got paid, not everybody on a timely basis. Right. But uh, so that's the way I look at it. 
So, nearly 50 years of, of service. You know, the greatest way to reduce unemployment expenditures at the federal and state level would be a reduction in the federal unemployment rate, which is today 3.4%, which is the lowest rate since 1969. That's 54 years. It's pretty incredible. But you also spoke at the outset of the infrastructure that exists or does not exist at the state level. It seems as though the federal government needed to do something quickly. We were all in an emergency mode. Uh, not a lot of time to structure a program, uh, including the infrastructure that was necessary to administer that program in a efficient way, reducing to the fullest extent possible fraud and abuse. So, is it fair to say that the majority of the responsibility for the fraud and abuse is associated with the antiquated systems throughout the various states that we forced to administer this program? Uh, the antiquated systems were certainly a big part of the problem. But as my colleague, uh, Mr. Turner noted, states had been on notice for years about that program. I know New York State, uh, the controller said, the deputy controller said that uh, they had been on notice since 2010. Right, but I get that, but, but yeah. they were on notice to do something about their antiquated systems. This is like, you know, responsibility on steroids. We, the unemployment rate reached nearly 14%. No, I understand. It, it, the states were overwhelmed, that, that was for sure. But I think it, it goes to the incentive question. You know, in normal times, this is state money that's collected from taxes put on employers in that state. And they knew that there was fraud. They knew there were improper payments. So I, in my opinion, looking back on this from an oversight standpoint, they bear some responsibility for not being better prepared. Now, whether they would have been prepared to deal with the overwhelming issue brought by the pandemic is an open question. I yield back, thank you. Thank you, Representative. Recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Winstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna thank you all for being here today. Appreciate your time. I'm glad we're having this hearing to examine really the unprecedented levels of fraud in the pandemic, pandemic unemployment programs. You know, I often think about our job here and in situations like this, I think of the song, America the Beautiful, uh, where we're, we ask God to help us mend our every flaw. And uh, I think this is a perfect example of us trying to do that. Uh, Mr. Turner, thank you for clarifying today too, the difference between improper payments and, and fraud itself. Uh, 191 billion, I believe, is, is what's reported out from DOL. You know, in my home state of Ohio, it's estimated a billion dollars may have been paid in fraudulent unemployment claims from March 2020 to June 2022. And the problem is so rampant that our own governor, Mike DeWine, and his wife, Fran, and our lieutenant governor, John Houston, were notified that fraudulent claims had been filed in their own names. It went that far. Uh, so it's a widespread problem. It harms Americans that it was designed to help. And, and obviously, we don't want that. That's a given. So many of my Republican uh, colleagues have been committed to protecting Americans who have been victims uh, of this fraud. In fact, when this committee was in markup for the American Rescue Plan, I offered an amendment to require the IRS to implement a hold harmless process for those taxpayers whose 1099Gs are flagged as unreported income if those taxpayers believe they are victims of identity theft or fraud, such that no penalties or interest would, would accrue against them. Uh, this amendment was objected to by one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. At that time, Ranking Member Neal promised that if I withdrew my amendment, uh, we would work together to address th this issue. Uh, unfortunately, it had, hadn't ever happened. And uh, Mr. Chairman, with your consent, I'd like to submit a copy of my amendment uh, on that uh, for the record. Without objection. And um, so I will say that uh, despite um, not really investigating the root cause of the frauds during the pandemic, uh, we saw the Department of Labor has 
distributed $2 billion in the American Rescue Plan to detect and prevent fraud, promote equitable access, and ensure the timely payment of benefits with respect to unemployment compensation programs. The Department of Labor has yet to provide a full accounting of how this funding uh, has been used. Uh, I think we need to circle our wagons there. And the only available information that I've seen shows DOL has only used 18% of those funds for fraud identification and recovery. So Mr. Turner, do you have any data currently on how many taxpayers had their identities stolen to claim IU benefits fraudulently? Is, is there any tracking the IRS does to aggregate information uh, from the Form 1099-G about the amount? of taxable unemployment benefits that were flagged by states or individuals as fraudulent. I, I think it's an important piece of the puzzle. puzzle. So if you could help me there, I'd appreciate it. Uh, yes, uh, we are, this is still early in, in this stage. We are still gathering the data on that. Okay. But it is, it is part of our plan. We uh, hope to do that uh, this year, but because of uh, constraints, we've pushed it off to next year. But we, we do have plans to do so. I appreciate that. Um, as soon as we can, uh, that would be helpful information for us. The state of Ohio has been able to recover more than <clears throat> $390 million <clears throat> in unemployment benefits. And despite the work being done by the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services and our participation in the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, Ohio is not receiving any portion of the funding they have recovered the majority of which are pandemic unemployment assistance and federal pandemic unemployment compensation funds. So they're really trying to do their work. Uh, you know, states like Ohio are making investments in fraud recovery and prevention efforts as they continue to recover these fraudulent payments. I think we should be working to incentivize their investments in these recover efforts. Mr. Turner, what thoughts do you have on any policy recommendations that would incentivize states to pursue the fund recovery work. And you may have mentioned this earlier, and I apologize if I'm asking a question again. Not a problem. That is one of the recommendations that the Department of Labor have, and we concur with that recommendation. We think anything that will incentivize and help people uh, more be more interested in recovering those funds is a, is a great move. What would you suggest that incentive look like? Well, 5%, uh, I think, is what they are proposing, okay. and we would agree with that. The only th caveat that we would add on that is that it be returned back to the UI program, administration of it. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, with your consent, I'd like to submit a letter from Ohio Governor DeWine to the Secretary of Labor, Martin Walsh, for the record. With no objection. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I'd like to recognize the gentle lady from the state of Alabama, Ms. Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To be clear, none of us want waste, fraud, and abuse in any government program. We all were sent here to be good stewards of taxpayers' money. I also want to just say that the facts are that we dealt with a once-in-a-generation pandemic and that there were lots of Americans, vulnerable Americans, who were left more vulnerable because of this pandemic. In my state of Alabama alone, 532,000 Alabamians were spared from economic disaster because of the work done by this committee and the House of Representatives in the early months of COVID-19. The American Rescue Plan provided many states, unemployment offices, the necessary resources to ensure that funds got out the door in a timely fashion to those facing the most dire economic and health scenarios imaginable at no fault of their own. I will never forget the sight, the sight of family after family lining up in cars to local charities and to churches and to pantries to have food loaded into their cars. And do you know why I will never forget it? Because I was bagging and loading lots of those groceries each and every time I was at home. These people were people who two weeks ago, earlier than when, this, the, when the pandemic started, had jobs and no fear of losing the roof over their heads. And then all of a sudden, they had friends and neighbors turning to them, offering them assistance to just get by. I didn't want my families to just get by. I wanted them to get back on their feet. The actions taken by the Ways and Means Committee in a matter of weeks ensured that millions of my constituents not only got by, but were able to pay their mortgage, make their mortgage payments, as well as to fill their kitchen cabinets. While facing a crisis like this, none of us have experienced. 
we do know that fraud did occur. But as all of you have said over the course of the last few hours, this was not something that was just sprung upon us. As you said, Mr. Mr. Dewar, uh, as controller, you understand that we, um, that the states were not prepared. You said that. And I can tell you from firsthand experience to the state that I represent, Alabama was not prepared. But because we gave them resources in the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, they got prepared. And as they got prepared, it took time. They were, uh, you know, learning how to ride the bicycle as the bicycle was going down the road. And there were problems with it. But I also know that, Mr. Chairman, it's not fair to talk about the system without actually having on this panel workers who worked in these state agencies to be able to talk in earnest about what went on in those state agencies. I also know that we did give money. We gave money uh, back when this pandemic first got started and the Trump administration did not put together um, an anti-fraud program that would help prevent this. Now, I know that fraud will happen in any program, but I guess my question to you is what can we do to make sure that states are more prepared and actually assist in finding those fraudsters that are out there? Um, I know that so many of the folks uh, that work in these, uh, uh, these uh, Department of Labor's and the states are good, earnest people who are trying to do their job. They just need more resources, more people uh, in, in order to do that and better systems. So what can we do um, as a pro prophylactic measure to really help address the lack of preparedness in state agencies? Um, the first thing I'd suggest is that I mentioned earlier the Fraud Reduction and Data Analytics Act that Congress passed in 2016. That only applies to federal agencies. It doesn't apply to the state agencies. So I think if you would apply it to the state agencies and encourage and incentivize them to implement a comprehensive anti-fraud strategy on a continual basis, which would be effective throughout the whole period of time, that would be the number one thing. The number two thing is if in future emergencies, uh, there are measures, if they have that in place, there should be not as much of a need or a need at all for Congress to allow self-certifications. That, I think, helped uh, tie the hands of the states a bit because they weren't allowed to ask for documentation and support. So those two things would allow them to be prepared, manage the normal program much better, and be prepared for emergencies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that we really should have had state administrators uh, on this panel as well as workers who worked in this area, that that would have given us a more broader view about what we can all do to help uh, prevent fraud in the future. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank Representative. Like I said earlier, this is just the first of many oversight hearings. The reason why we're doing it this way is, is because we didn't have any in the prior two Congresses, and so we're glad that we're at least starting. Uh, I'd love to recognize the gentleman from the state of Illinois, Mr. LaHood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for your valuable testimony and service here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and making this a top priority for our new majority. It's so vital that we do this. And I, I want to, I, I know it's been referenced, but it, it has been frustrating that this is the first hearing we're having on this. As everybody knows, COVID began, you know, in, in the spring of, of 20. and. Obviously, we have been concerned about fraud in this space for the last two years, uh, but this is the first hearing we're having. And it's not for a lack of trying. I just want to reference two letters that, um, at the time, our Republican leader, Mr. Brady, sent to this committee asking for a hearing. March 12, 2021, we write uh, to the chairman uh, requesting an immediate schedule and oversight hearing on the Ways and Means Committee to investigate reports and uh, of, and. Uh, reports of fraud in unemployment insurance programs enacted through COVID pandemic. No response to that at all. So with no response, we send another letter uh, 10 months later, February 22nd, 2020, again at the time uh, to, to the chairperson from uh, Ranking Member Brady, uh, Ms. Walorski and Tom Rice and Mr. Kelly, again, um, asking to investigate the size, scope and severity of criminal fraud in pandemic unemployment insurance. No response, unfortunately. I would like to submit both these record, both of these letters for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. 
Uh, couple that with what uh, Dr. Winstrup just said. We offered an amendment uh, to, to get to the bottom of this on unemployment insurance, nothing. So here we are today uh, having this hearing today. And so uh, again, vitally important that, uh, that we uh, use our responsibility uh, with oversight to have some accountability in this program. Um, Mr. Horowitz, I wanted to uh, ask you a couple questions here. Um, as we've heard here today, the more time passes, the harder it is to get these dollars backed. And so um, it's, it's high time that someone start asking questions and look into how do we claw back billions of dollars. My question specifically for you, um, obviously you're working in your capacity across uh, all of government uncovering these fraud schemes and getting real results in terms of suggestions for criminal prosecutions and hopefully convictions and some jail sentences for those involved, which will hopefully send a deterrent message. Um, a bit of a hypothetical question, but if you had $2 billion today, how would you use those funds to ramp up efforts to recover the funds and hold wrongdoers accountable? Um, well, first off, that would be magnitudes greater than we've gotten in the past for any of the IGs. Um, and, uh, but what we would do is a um, couple things increase our agents, the number of law enforcement and other auditors and analytics capacity that we have so we can find the fraud, pursue the fraud. I would actually um, also then provide analysts to the various task forces like we're doing already, the National Pandemic Unemployment Insurance Task Force, so that we can be a force multiplier in that regard. And then finally, very importantly, there's gonna to need to be more prosecutors, both at the federal level and at the local level, to deal with these cases. We can investigate them, but we've gotta hand them off to somebody who'll actually go to a courtroom and pursue the prosecutions. And is there an example of a state that's been very proactive in terms of hiring state uh, prosecutors to do that? Um, there have been a number of states, and I, would, I wouldn't wanna leave one out. We're working with a lot of states. We've had great relationships with a variety of states. Um, who are dealing with these issues. Uh, it, it's just gonna grow though exponentially as we uncover more and more fraud and as the labor IG uh, uh, you know, finds more and more fraud and as we find the overseas fraud, right? That's the hardest to find and is gonna take us the most amount of time to get to. Um, in your testimony, Mr. Horowitz, you provided a recommendation that Congress should amend the Program Fraud Civil Remedies Act uh, to, to raise the jurisdictional limit for administrative recoveries of smaller claims. Uh, what is the threshold we are using now and how does it compare to the amounts we're talking about in fraud from U, uh, UI programs? So the, the threshold right now is $150,000. It, it provides the Program Fraud Civil Remedies Act that we can use the civil process in it through administrative means, which means we don't have to type the federal courts or federal prosecutors for lower dollar uh, fraud claims. We want to increase that to a million dollars because we've seen the extraordinary number of payments that went out that were below that million dollar amount. And the reality is that given the limitations on resources at the U.S. Attorney's offices and for prosecutors around the country at the state and local level, um, we're going to have challenges getting them to take smaller fraud cases. Mm -hmm. We at a minimum want to be able to use the civil processes to collect the money back for the taxpayers. And so that's why that's so crucial. Uh, crucial. We've had, by the way, bipartisan support for it. It just hasn't made its way through Congress. Great, thank you. I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman and uh, recognize the gentle lady from Washington State, Del Bene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here today and for sharing your testimony with the committee. Um, however, an important voice is missing from this conversation, and that's the voice of the millions of people and the families for whom the expanded unemployment insurance um, during the pandemic was a lifeline. Um, if we think back to 2020 um, and the fear and the uncertainty that our country was facing as that first case of COVID was reported in my district in the state of Washington, um, we saw many workers laid off, uh, no longer receiving a pay paycheck, some had to find childcare quickly because their kids were taking classes at home. Small business owners were wondering how they could keep their businesses afloat. Overnight, our world shut down. Our nation lost nearly 22 million jobs at the outset on the pandemic. And Congress needed to act. And we needed to act quickly to ensure that families kept food on their tables and roofs over their heads. And that's exactly what we did. 
To address the dramatic level of job loss and hardship caused by the pandemic, Congress passed bipartisan legislation which temporarily increased state unemployment insurance benefits by $600 a week. And this ensured that families had the money they needed to stay afloat. We also created temporary benefits to self-employed workers who were not covered by state UI programs to ensure that these people were not left without support. These changes and increased funds had a real impact for the families and the workers in our communities. I wanted to share the story of a Washington family, um, Lori, who works for an education nonprofit, and her husband worked for music venues. Her husband was undergoing cancer treatment and their family was already living paycheck to paycheck. When the pandemic hit, Lori's husband was laid off due to the live entertainment industry shutting down. The extra $600 in unemployment insurance was critical to ensure that Lori's family was able to pay their mortgage, pay medical bills, car payments, and meet the basic needs of their teenage daughter. Critical programs like the expanded unemployment insurance and the Paycheck Protection Program were essential to our record-breaking economic recovery. Because of the actions that Congress took then, the American job market has exceeded pre-pandemic levels and we now have historic unemployment. Um, incredible impact. So thank you for this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Representative. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm so glad we're having this hearing today on this very important topic. You know, the, the facts are that as representatives, we have a responsibility to ensure taxpayer dollars are used efficiently and effectively and the evidence is apparent, there has been nearly unchecked unemployment fraud. Now, I wanna be clear, in the early uncertain days of the pandemic, there were good reasons to help countless Americans who faced those unprecedented economic challenges through no fault of their own. But we're nearly three years past the first pandemic-related legislation, and my colleagues on the left have chosen to completely ignore the rampant fraud that has cost taxpayers an untold amount um, and estimates in some uh, points and uh, in, in some outlets have ranged uh, up to as high as uh, three to four hundred billion dollars. In addition to the money lost, there's evidence of gross incompetence, including from the, the governor's Department of Labor in my home state of Kansas that left many without assistance who desperately needed it. Despite unemployment being a function managed by the state, my office in Wichita received more than a thousand calls from constituents who were negatively impacted by Kansas, un, by Kansas unemployment system. I have many stories of people impacted. For more than a half a year, one constituent waited while her legitimate claim mysteriously ended up in the fraud department. Despite repeated calls and attempts to resolve the issue, nobody in the Kansas Department of Labor could help her. Others reached out to let us know that they themselves had been victims of fraud. Uh, several received a notification in the fall of 2020 that someone had filed claims for unemployment under, under their name and, and received a 1099 in 2021, claiming that they owed taxes on the benefits uh, someone else had received. Today, we still hear from Kansans who are victims of fraud or have yet to receive benefits they deserve. These are just a few of the cases, but they point to a real problem in Kansas and across the country. Taxpayers lost out to fraudsters who used the pandemic, massive amounts of federal funds and weak state leadership to game the system. In May of 2021, Ways and Means Republican held a round table on this subject and I invited state representative Sean Tarwater to testify. As the chair of the Kansas House of Commerce, Labor and Economic Development Committee, he saw firsthand the issue with fraud and unemployment. In his testimony, he said, we documented over 40 times Kansas Department of Labor was notified, directed, and informed about massive concerns regarding unemployment benefit frauds. He also said that when the Kansas Department of Labor, uh, when asked about the fraud, their response was they're not worried about the fraud because the big money, quote unquote, was in the federal funds and it was mostly the federal programs that were being targeted. And that they would always add that they were not held responsible for those funds so that it was not a priority. Mr. Chair, I'd like to submit to the record two audits conducted by the Kansas Legislative uh, Division of Post Audit that indicated uh, roughly $700 million in potentially fraudulent payments were made, with half coming from state funds and half coming from federal, or about $344 million. Without objection. Despite the evidence, there's not an incentive for states to recover these unemployment frauds, and hardworking Kansas taxpayers are left with the bill. 
Mr. Horowitz, what processes are in place for states to help recoup funds lost to UI fraud, both state and federal funding? So um, I think one of the key parts of that is, um, is working closely with IGs, local state uh, law enforcement, um, and their state's attorneys general to make sure there are processes by which the taxpayers can get the money back. That's one of the things we're trying to do is work closely and have, and have focused on with state auditors. In fact, we have a we created the first ever state auditor in residence program. So we have two Tennessee state auditors working with the PRAC to help us, as well as the former California state auditor, so we can develop those relationships and work more closely with the states. So how, how are you looking at or expecting states to, to recover funds that may have been uh, uh, a result of international crime? And what state or federal jurisdiction is there, and, and what's been currently done on that, on that front? So um, the, the SWAs, the state workforce agencies, they're not the law enforcement arm of this, of course. So um, the key is working with local law enforcement, federal law enforcement. We're working with the Secret Service, FBI, other federal law enforcement agencies, and trying to develop those partnerships because that is the key to the success of moving forward. There has to be the interest not only in making sure the money gets out, which is obviously important, to the right people, but then making sure when it doesn't get to the right people that there's the recovery. Right. Well, thank you. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for the work that you're doing on behalf of the American taxpayers and helping make sure that uh, we get money in the right hands and that the taxpayers are protected. I yield back. I want to thank the representative. And now I'll recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker. Five minutes. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding uh, this hearing. Uh, oversight is an important role of uh, this committee, of Congress. And when we know that there's uh, at least 60 billion lowest number and perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars that uh, were fraudulently uh, given to others than those who deserved it, we should be, we should be uh, uh, evaluating that and looking at and, and seeing whether the administration did all they could to prevent that and see whether this committee under Democrat leadership ad advocated their responsibility to provide that, uh, that oversight. I'd like to use my time to respond uh, to a few of the comments made by Democrats, starting um, with the ranking member who I have a great deal uh, of respect for. Uh, he opened with a fiery speech uh, that um, conflated the idea that looking at fraud was the same as uh, trying to prevent benefits from going to uh, individuals who really needed a lifeline. And I say it's quite the opposite. Uh, and in fact, if another thing we heard was that there's a voice missing here, voices of families who benefited from those dollars, I think they would be appalled to know that as much potentially as for every dollar that they received in a lifeline went to someone that didn't receive it and will be paid either by them or by their kids and their grandkids, which is most likely, they would be appalled at that. And I think it would be important to have, have their input on that. I thought, based on uh, the ranking member's comment, that he perhaps misunderstood the purpose of this uh, hearing in conflating those two messages. And then as I listened further to um, other Democrat co comments, I realized it was more than that. They were literally trying to say that Republicans, by holding a hearing of this sort, did not support helping individuals. And again, that's just not true. And they also said that uh, we didn't vote for $2 billion worth of fraud prevention. And I'd like to remind Democrats that that was included in a bill of about 1900, $1,900 billion that we felt would do more, more harm than good. We were worried about the inflationary impact of that bill that would harm the American people far more than the handouts that have been provided. Uh, and by the way, we heard that from um, individuals, everyday Americans in our first uh, hearing, uh, where uh, individuals said uh, that those inflationary pressures they have now are, are hurting their ability to provide for their families 
and are, are, are threatening their ability to be able to keep uh, their businesses open. And I, I know this has been mentioned before, but I'll say it as well to the ranking member and the rest of the Democrats here. I thought it was very unfortunate that Democrats were unwilling to leave the bubble of Washington, D.C. and hear from real American people the impacts of our policies. And I appreciated that the chairman put together a field hearing, and I know we're doing more, and I hope that Democrats will reconsider because I think it was a very, very valuable hearing, and I think it'd be worth all of us uh, hearing that. By the way, we were right in the impacts of that 1.9 trillion ARPA. Uh, we had all first voted for the CARES Act. We felt it was, we felt it was absolutely important, but it led to the highest inflation rate in, in 40 years. We were right, and if you wanna talk about Biden's economic policies, I uh, read a newsletter this morning that I thought nailed it pretty well. You know, Biden came in and inherited a, an economy that was growing at 6.5% and an inflation rate of 1.5%. And somehow he was in two years successful at completely inverting those numbers. And we had 6.5% inflation in an economy that is barely, that is barely growing. Uh, one additional point. Uh, and this goes back to something the ranking member said as well. He proposed the idea that people did not respond, that almost 40% of Pennsylvanians received more on unemployment than they could have earned going back to work. And he believed that people did not respond to that by staying home. And that, that I think, doesn't recognize the very nature, the very uh, characteristic of human nature. We all, tend to do what is right for ourselves. We look out for our best interests. And one of the arguments that we had as Republicans against ARPA is that we put people in this terrible position of needing to decide that if they went back to work, they would be less able to provide for their families. It's an awful position to put people in. And we don't fault anyone for taking available what, or for taking advantage of what was available to them, but it was a bad decision on our part. We could have done far better as we wanted to at that time by incentivizing people to go back to work. One of the uh, amendments that we had included on that bill, they were all rejected, but one was to provide a $1,500 bonus for people to go back to work. Think how that would have changed where we are uh, right now. We heard directly at that hearing of individuals, of owners of businesses, who talked directly to employees and said, we won't come back to work because we'd lose this benefit or that benefit. And I've talked to hundreds of uh, employers who were in the same position. It was a, it was a badly guided decision uh, that, had, uh, that has harmed American people far more than the government handouts that were included with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I'm over time. Thank you, Representative. I'd like to re recognize the gentlelady from the state of California, Ms. Chu. I'd like to start by reminding my colleagues that the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program was authorized by the CARES Act and extended by the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, both in overwhelmingly bipartisan votes. Additionally, Ways and Means Democrats secured funding to fight fraud and to recover taxpayer dollars in the American Rescue Plan, which actually is the very reason why we have the testimony from the witnesses before us today. The pandemic was an unprecedented disruption of our economy, which is why Democrats and Republicans acted together to expand unemployment benefits as quickly as possible to assist American families who, through no fault of their own, suddenly found themselves without a way to provide for their families' basic needs. This was a success, which is why the U.S. has had a stronger economic recovery than any of our peers. And we learned many lessons along the way, including that there were gaps in the distribution of these benefits for individuals such as my constituent, Damien, a father of two who is self-employed and also works part-time as an ambulance driver to make ends meet. Damien didn't qualify for pandemic unemployment assistance, even though his primary employment was self-employment because he had a small amount of wage income that qualified him for regular UI. So I was proud to champion the inclusion of benefits for 
mixed earners like Damien in the bipartisan 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act. Likewise, I have heard from many individuals that federal pan pandemic unemployment was a lifeline for providing for basic necessities like food and life-saving medications. That includes Gretchen from Altadena, California, who has been in the film and television industry for the last 30 years and is a cancer survivor whose medical coverage is predicated on the number of hours worked. And Mary from Pasadena, a nursery school teacher whose employer's doors closed and had to file for unemployment for the first time in her 26 year career. And May, the primary breadwinner for her family living in Sierra Madre, trying to stay afloat while distance learning with her three kids. The swift action of Congress mitigated the hardship that jobless workers and their families suffered and was essential in stabilizing an economy that lost a staggering 22 million jobs in just two months in early 2020. We know that there are lessons to be learned from these efforts that can strengthen and sustain the UI system for future emergencies. And I hope that it's the goal of this hearing um, that we do not neglect our duties to protect our workers in the midst of a global pandemic. So, Mr. Dodoro, um, although this is not mentioned in today's testimony, GAO also conducted discussion groups with recipients of UI benefits, is that correct? Yes. Well, tell me what are some of the things they said in terms of what they spent their benefit on, and did they talk about how the benefits affected their housing and their credit? Uh, we conducted uh, these discussion groups in six states. We did two in each state for 12 discussion groups, and uh, people told us they spent their funds on rent, utilities, uh, food, and uh, health care and other essential activities during that period of time. So it helped sustain them through that period of time. They, they also had a lot to say about the difficulty in getting the benefits in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and we included that in our report as well. And how did this affect their housing and their credit? Well, it helped them to maintain, you know, paying their bills. So I, I would assume that added a Know, positive or at least didn't have a negative effect on their credit. Mm -hmm. And what do the dozens of high quality research studies GAO reviewed say about the effect that providing UI benefits during this pandemic and in past recessions had on economic stability? Uh, we reviewed 30 uh, empirical studies that were done uh, and those studies indicated that it helped support to stabilize the economy during that period of time. It helped prevent the situation from getting worse. Uh, and so it had a, a you know, positive effect. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you calling the uh, hearing today. Um, I, I can't help but think we've gotten sidetracked a little bit. Um, the purpose of this hearing is not to hear um, stories that obvious how important these, these funds were. I mean, my God, everybody can talk about how we desperately needed this program. We're here to talk about the fact that fraud occurred. Let me just redirect, pull us all back, and um, let's just direct in the right direction, get the facts. Uh, I, I would just like to correct a few things, I guess. President last night said he's added 12 million jobs, the greatest in history. Well, he got rid of 10 million jobs because of what we did during the pandemic. It's just actually recapturing them. So let's get to the facts, let's be true. And we talk about the unemployment rate. Yeah, it's low, but our workforce participation rate now is lower than it was in January 2020 to the tune where more than two and a half million people are not working today who were working in January of 2020, hence the need for workers everywhere. That doesn't even add in the 18 million individuals who are now receiving Medicaid benefits, who, because President Biden, who has said the pandemic was over, continues the public health emergency where no state is allowed to audit its Medicaid rolls. So that's over 20 million people that we're talking about that should be back in the workforce and actually contributing to Social Security, contributing to Medicare. We'd love to get those people back. 
And so we're here today to talk about fraud, fraud. And sadly enough, fraud occurs. It's not a Republican problem. It's not a Democrat problem. It's an American problem. It is the fact that when free money, when money flows freely, people take advantage of it. Period, point blank. In North Carolina, a citizen from the Republic of India uh, alleged that they obtained $40,000 in pandemic unemployment insurance for North Carolina residents, which by the way, anybody who's in the resident is in the embassy of India, by the way, in the District of Columbia can vote, just, just as an aside to my Democratic friends that we're gonna hopefully stop. Um, second, a federal grand jury in Greenville, North Carolina, where I lived, um, indicted three individuals for conspiring to commit wire and mail fraud for a heroin and fentanyl distribution ring in Eastern North Carolina. Again, fraud occurs when money flows freely. It's not just balloons for everybody. It's actual real things that happen. Lastly, a woman in Charlotte uh, was uh, pleaded guilty of a million dollars in um, unemployment insurance fraud by defrauding the state of Arizona. These are real things and I commend you guys for the work that you've done. I, I attack us for not actually attacking this earlier, earlier, $350 million in North Carolina. And so we all know it's what we're talking about. We're not here to tell stories of, of how we helped it. We did, we can all tell those stories because it was absolutely needed. I just find it interesting that my colleagues across the aisle are happy to say uh, that President Trump's administration didn't put in um, fraud committee while they blame him for everything else, but then take credit for all the work that Biden did. So I just, I think that's kind of interesting. So let me just ask a, a few questions as it is. Um, Mr. Um, Gadara, can I just, what percentage of your workforce is back to work? Um, everyone. Everybody's back to work. Well, we were never not out of work. Okay. We, yeah, no, we've not. been working all the time. Excellent, excellent. I'm, I'm really glad to hear this. Um, the, I, I asked this to Mr. Turner and also to, again to Mr. Dara. Does the GAO and the Department of Labor know to the extent in which international cyber crime rings and foreign actors were involved in targeting state systems at all? Do we have any uh, information about what happened against, uh, against with cyber crime international figures for fraud for this? I think that question could best be answered by Mr. Horowitz and Mr. Turner. Okay, please do. Uh, yes, uh, it is equally spread, as well, equally may be the wrong word, but it's spread throughout uh, on the international side as well as domestic. Yeah, we, we've seen uh, fraud occurring overseas. Secret Service has testified about this, about breaking up various rings in Nigeria, Russia, China, for example. Right, and I think it's, uh, uh, and I'll just kind of end with this because I don't want to beat a dead horse. It, we all know that this fraud occurred and we all know that we've um, not done our job as members of Congress in providing oversight, you know, it, it, it just seems to be an action that one side of this um, uh, body just is happy to flow the funds. And yes, our American people need it. But for those of us who've actually run businesses, there has to be accountability as to where our money goes. This isn't our money, this is the taxpayer's money. And if we don't know where it goes and where it should not be going, then we're out of business. And this Congress, oh my God, you know, look at our debt, which some people don't believe exists. Um, we would be out of business, absolutely, if we did not commit to making sure that our money is well spent and that criminals, criminals are put back. And let me just ask a real quick question. If you just two seconds, if you will, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, can you expand on the suggestion to increase the penalties for these individuals? Um, yes, yeah, so what, what we've actually asked for is increasing the statute of limitations from five years to 10 years. The challenge for us, and I know for Department of Labor IG, is we're already three years since the beginning of the benefits going out. We've got a lot of work still to do. Right. Um, so if it runs out in 2025, for some cases, that's gonna be a problem. We're gonna need the 10 years. Congress did this last year, bipartisan basis, extended it for the two big SBA programs. Paycheck Protection Program, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, they should do the same here. Well, thank you. I, I hope that that's a bipartisan effort that we can understand that fraud does occur and that we need to uh, enable you guys to actually um, investigate it and uh, put those criminals behind bars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I want to thank the representative, but I also want to tack on to his points in regards to the unemployment numbers we've heard um, numerous times. It's also important to know the fact 
that workforce participation is currently at 62.3%, which is the lowest since Jimmy Carter was president. Love to recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you also to the ranking member. Thank you, Chairman Smith, for convening today's hearing. Thank you also to the witnesses. Um, I know that you had made diligent efforts to warn Congress early on about the potential for, for fraud in the CARES program. And unfortunately, uh, we have not had these hearings until now to examine the extent of the unemployment fraud, but we're committed to, to doing these examinations. I do want to ask, if I can, there was, um, relating to Mr. Horwitz's testimony just a moment ago, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record the very first alert on the pandemic unemployment fraud issue that was issued by the United States Secret Service that I believe Mr. Horowitz just referenced. It's dated May the 14th of 2020. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The alert is titled Massive Fraud Against State Unemployment Insurance Programs, and it was directed to financial institutions across the country and to what Mr. Horwitz just said. It warned them of a well-organized Nigerian fraud ring that was exploiting the COVID-19 crisis to commit large-scale fraud against state unemployment insurance programs. The alert indicated, or indicated rather, that banks at all levels, at all levels were being targeted and that the fraud ring possessed a substantial database of personally identifiable information of first responders, government personnel, and school employees. Uh, Mr. Horwitz, back to you for a moment. I think you testified a week ago before the House Oversight Committee. That's correct. Your, um, some of your testimony, what you said is referenced, uh, I saw in an ABC News article <clears throat> from last week. This is, this is what it said you cited, if I can, if I can read from this report. Uh, it says of the $5 trillion, $5 trillion total spent on pandemic relief throughout the, both the Trump and the Biden administrations, Horowitz said that the amount siphoned <clears throat> off by fraud could be anywhere from tens of billions of dollars to over $100 billion, but that it would be years before the final numbers were tallied. The issue, Horowitz said, was that the trillion dollar programs had to get off the ground quickly to prevent potential economic collapse, but they lacked key fraud protections, including verification systems and information sharing with other agencies to match up social security numbers with people's names and birth dates. So I guess my first question is that that fairly accurately reflects what you testified to last week. It does. You testified that the fraud could be over $100 billion. We've heard a lot of numbers testified to today. Um, in fact, it could greatly exceed $100 billion, right? I don't know. It could. All right. I'm a former United States attorney. Mr. Fitzpatrick is a former FBI agent. Mr. Hood is a former assistant U.S. attorney. I think everybody here, um, hopefully on both sides, is concerned about the amount of fraud. Um, when do we know that number? When will we know that number? I think it's going to be years to get a more precise number, exactly for the reasons you just read, which is, and as you know, having been a federal prosecutor and for anybody who's been in law enforcement, to find the overseas fraud is particularly challenging. Yeah. You need to go through, you need the help of other countries to find the money because mm -hmm. it probably isn't in the United States anymore. It's probably somewhere overseas. Do you, do you have an opinion whether the, the biggest fraud is, uh, is committed by domestic entities and individuals or by foreign entities? Um, I think it probably depends on the type of scheme we're talking about. I think whenever you undertake programs like happened with the two programs last week, the SBA programs, and the self-certification here for some of the UI programs, you're inviting fraudsters to come in. They don't, they can be in the United States, they can be overseas. One of the things, by the way, we are looking at with the data analytics we're, we're able to use, we're looking at IP addresses now that we have that information. We're going to try and figure out how much of the incoming was from overseas. 
If I can briefly, two more questions. Again, you cited the problems with the system. Essentially, the systems don't talk to each other. The couldn't match up the social security numbers with people's names and birth dates. If we had another incident today, like the pandemic that called for whatever relief, are those safeguards in place today? So the, the good news is things are improving. The bad news is we're not there yet. Um, and credit to many of the state workforce agencies that have come together to, to try and build identity verification systems and share information across their agencies. Because for unemployment insurance, at least, we're dealing with 54 different entities managed at the local level, um, and they need to work together better. There are efforts underway. There's a lot more that needs to be done to get there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I can just, just briefly, um, in your written report, you talk about the, the, um, the, the uh, practice working co collaboratively with the Department of Justice, with the uh, National Credit Union Administration, other law enforcement agencies. You cite in your report that the data collection effort identified about $8.75 million that may be subject to recovery. I applaud that, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket. Do you have other programs with other fiduciaries, uh, uh, domestic banks, et cetera, larger financial institutions? That's what we're working with, and we're working with the, the Secret Service and other law enforcement that have been um, engaged with the financial institutions, as you know. Um, people think of the Secret Service primarily as protecting the president and other dignitaries, but they actually have a major role in dealing with counterfeiting and, and other financial institution fraud. So they've got a lot of relationships. We're trying to leverage off of those in our work. I, thank you, sir. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Uh, please recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore. Thank you so very, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to join the bipartisan rebuke of fraud. And I want to commend uh, all of you for the efforts that you're making for recovery. Uh, and um, I, you know, I'm, as a member, I'm willing to explore ways uh, to help with that recovery uh, act. Um, as many of you have indicated in your testimony, written and verbal here today, that this is not a new problem. We've heard various dates pushed out by many of my colleagues about when this started, but I was thinking that uh, 2010 was when the GAO first gave us uh, a warning that our systems were at risk. Is that right, sir, Mr. Dutter? Well, we, we, we've, uh, I don't know. What I said about 2010 was that the New York Deputy Controller notified New York State in 2010 that their systems needed to be improved. Right, okay, thank you for that clarification. And you know, I'm from Wisconsin, and um, I know that our IT systems go back to the 1970s. Um, um, you know, there was a sharp drop in eligible uh, unemployment recipients from like 40, 50% to 28%. And what states like Wisconsin did, many states did, is there, their staff, their trained staff, uh, was also reduced uh, in proportion to, to that. So no one was ready for this pandemic. That just left things open for, uh, uh, for, for fraud, I would think. And I would like to just get some clarification from Mr. Turner. You mentioned that you know, a lot of the overpayments that we saw, and maybe even underpayments, were not people's faults necessarily. They were states' faults, uh, their administrative problems that they had given this old technology and how overwhelming it was. I mean, we, you know, I have a report that I'm going to ask to be entered into the, um, uh, uh, into the record. And it talks about how in Wisconsin, for example, that 80% of the people who called, they just let the phones ring uh, because they couldn't respond to it. So would you, would you agree that, that really stuff outside of that, you know, states not implementing it, the Trump administration not it, 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 it implementing your recommendations, that these things um, created a glide path for fraud. Well, there was a, a lot of mistakes uh, made from the uh, states. And in some cases, uh, it was uh, a lack of training on yeah. the part of the staff. In the case of PUA, uh, it was a lack of understanding the program in some cases. 
and therefore that caused some of the errors. Right. But given that, I, I guess the other thing that I would like to know from you, um, uh, with all of your experience, uh, Mr. Dodero, Dodero, um, do you still stand by the statement that the U.S. Government Accountability Office reviewed 30 different empirical studies um, and uh, concluded that UI benefits created overall economic stability and improved outcomes for individuals? I do. Okay. And I just am sort of wondering if we had not provided, you said you were there when Mr. Paulson showed up asking for that $700 billion. Um, do you think we could have had the same kind of catastrophic events had we not provided unemployment? I, I think the, uh, yes. We've... The 54 million people, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, also, you did these, these uh, 30 reports, and I, um, you said you reported that eight of the 12 studies reviewed discussed whether the benefits discouraged uh, folk from returning to work, <coughs> and they said no. Is that, is that something? That is that's, the case? That's what the studies concluded. Okay, very good. Well, anyway, I would like, uh, before my time expires, to enter into the record a couple of documents. One from the Wisconsin Public Radio. Lives on hold, pandemic exposes failures of Wisconsin unemployment insurance system. Um, and really, it's, there are so, so many sad stories. I have other sad stories I'd like to enter into the record. Uh, from my district office, it talked about people just feeling almost suicidal and given up hope of not getting their benefits. Uh, this particular publication um, talks about a man in Wisconsin who moved into his car uh, because he, you know, he checked the wrong box. He said he, was, he didn't know why he was let go of the job. So that just sent his application into a weeks and months long uh, obscurity. Uh, and he was so humiliated as a man that he had to move in with his ex-wife and her new boyfriend uh, in order to survive. Uh, that, 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 that's, that's very humiliating, and I think I would like everybody to, to share that story with everybody. Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put in the record lives on hold. <coughs> Pandemic exposes failures of Wisconsin unemployment insurance system and some redacted copies of the, my constituents who were affected and appreciated it. Without objection. Without objection. Without objection. Thank you so much, sir, and I, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, um, just to slightly revisit the issue of state waivers uh, from a different angle. Um, was, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I believe by one of my colleagues, uh, referencing the GAO uh, report back in March of 2021, uh, in that report, you had discussed um, the issue of overpayments uh, with the PUA program. And the report said, um, uh, keying in on one provision there, the, said the DOL did not have plans to collect data on states utilizing authority to waive um, pandemic unemployment assistance overpayments uh, or the amount of overpayments that the states may have waived. Um, obviously, it's concerning that the exact amount of loss uh, due to fraud is not known for the reasons we discussed earlier. Um, but just uh, as far as having no information about states waiving over payments, uh, some of which may have been fraud, um, don't you believe that that information is in fact needed to effectively monitor um, and ultimately recover these overpayments? Yeah, absolutely. We recommended that the Labor Department require uh, the states to report how much money they've recovered, how much they've waived as well. And so I'm always wary of waivers. And uh, I think it's important that uh, the uh, Labor Department have accurate information from the states to monitor that effort. And any suggestion on a remedy there moving forward? Uh, there just needs to be required reporting of that. I think that's just proper management of the program uh, to be able to do that. And the, and the Department ought to follow up with the states, and I think it's also appropriate to either have the state auditors or perhaps at the federal level, one of us do a sample of the waivers to make sure they were adequately supported uh, during the process. So there, do you have, there needs do you have to the be manpower a, to do that? No, but uh, we could find some way to figure out how to do it. But somebody ought to do it. I think it's state auditors. Ought, would be the best position to do that. In fact, I don't think the federal government uses state auditors as effectively as possible.
for either the unemployment insurance program or the Medicaid program for that matter, because each state system is a little different. Right. Um, Mr. Turner, uh, in your testimony, you had um, uh, updated your estimate of improper payments uh, from roughly $163 billion to $191 billion, uh, with a significant um, portion attributable to fraud. Um, your esti uh, estimate uses DOL's reported improper payment rate of about 21.5% for fiscal year 2022. Um, understanding Mr. Horowitz's uh, well-made point that tracking this stuff is incredibly difficult once it leaves our shores, it does require cooperation with foreign governments. It's incredibly challenging. Nonetheless, I think it exposes a massive vulnerability uh, in our own system uh, to allow it to, to leave our shores uh, in the first place. But um, to the extent you haven't addressed this yet, sir, um, explaining why your estimate is so substantially different uh, from the administration's uh, estimate of 104 billion. Well, again, we take our uh, rate from the department uh, and based on what the department gave us, the 21.5, that's how we end up calculating it, the 191. So, uh, and that's, they're the ones that's responsible as the policy uh, uh, owners to provide that rate. So uh, we, can't, we can't develop it ourselves. Has there been any discussion with the administration of reconciling these numbers? Uh, no, there has not been. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Rec Thank you, Representative. In, uh, recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Tinney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. I really appreciate drilling down on these numbers. I'm actually a small business owner in upstate New York. Our business is in our 77th year, and we were greatly impact and have been continually impact like all of our our friends in business in New York by unemployment insurance by the man mismanagement of New York through a series of governors here and, and by the and, and I think it's it's fantastic that the chairman is doing a much needed uh, look into this and having you uh, a gentleman with your expertise here uh, to do this and uh, you know our taxpayers our employers our employees have paid the price for this fraud and uh, I, I just thought, you know, well, there's so many numbers being thrown out here. And since, uh, you know, one of my favorite authors was Mark Twain, he made a famous statement who I'm sure all of you in the accounting business knows. There are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Thank you, Mark Twain, who's buried in New York State uh, for that. But there are a lot of numbers being thrown around. And I, and I refer initially to the comments from the ranking member about uh, the unemployment and sometimes these are misleading. Uh, there's economic hardship right now in New York State and uh, you would think that you know with 3.7 percent that 96.3 percent of the rest of the country are all working which we know that's not how the numbers are calculated so that's why we need to drill into these statistics. But one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, is the recent findings from the GAO and I'm going to address my first uh, question to you Mr. Dodaro is that uh, there was an estimate of fraud, of, and you know you've answered this: 60 billion, with some outside experts going as high as 400 billion. We've heard 180 million, uh, billion, uh, but the New York fraud alone is estimated at about 11 billion, and that's for fraudulent un unemployment benefits since March 2020. In fact, the survey I conducted among my uh, constituents and employers was that countless cases of individuals have received unemployment forms they hadn't requested. They have dealt with these, they've dealt with these ramifications uh, without having any verification. The payments were made. There was no uh, look back to the employers as to whether these people were actually employed. Uh, and many of them were actually my family members who were still gainfully employed. And so uh, many of these, these problems continue to persist in New York. And I thank you for calling out New York for some of their systems. But on top of that, the New York State has an outstanding trust fund loan of nearly $8 billion which is yet to repay. Because of this gross mismanagement by the state, taxpayers, small businesses now have to make up that difference. And this has been devastating to especially the smaller employers, especially restaurants forced to close during the pandemic. Uh, and after all these hardships uh, for the past several years, I just wonder how it could possibly be fair to now foist this tab for this negligence on, on, uh, and incompetence, as you pointed out, uh, on New York taxpayers, uh, on our employers who can really, really cannot afford to, to keep this, and so many of them have closed. So I wanted to follow up with you and how, I wanna make sure that our federal policies are no longer allowing this reckless behavior by irresponsible governments like New York State, which you keep pointing out. 
Uh, and I know that my colleague from uh, Mr. Higgins mentioned this and alluded to this as well. But my question to you is that, is there a recommendation from the GAO, the Government Accounting Office, issued uh, to the Department of Labor that has not been implemented that would address these concerns? Uh, and is there a mechanism to compel New York to prioritize repaying this $8 billion of unemployment insurance loans outside of, say, an automatic increase in the state business taxes, which would make us have even a larger outmigration of, of people and jobs in our state? Yeah, well, there's a set of, rec we have 19 open recommendations mm -hmm. to the Department of Labor. Uh, eight of them focus on the fraud areas. Uh, the, there's a set that focus on the need to transform the unemployment insurance program itself to make it more effective. That may go to this issue of, of incentives of the states. One of the observations I've had over the years is where we're relying on states to administer federal programs. There's often a lot of deferential uh, uh, latitude that the federal government gives the states to implement the programs. There's not a lot of aggressive federal oversight that's needed. And it doesn't really come vividly clear until you have these type of circumstances in place. You know, in, in good times, we rely on the states to take, you know, to administer these programs and give them a lot of flexibility. Uh, but there needs to be a better balance between the federal responsibilities and the states, and the federal government has to have additional responsibilities. Now, the $8 billion, the states are allowed to borrow from the Treasury Department uh, when they run out of money. And then you're right, it has to be paid back by the employers within the state. So that's left to the state's own devices on how they decide to repay that money back to the federal government. Thank you. Can I just clarify one thing? The fraud risk assessment framework, is that what you're talking about with the 19 recommendations? That's eight of the, eight eight of the 19. Okay. The, other you, 19 the other ones go to the need to transform the whole program uh, to make it much more modern, efficient, and meant, meant to deal with our modern economy. Thank you. And please send that message back to the New York State government now <laughs> to save our employers. We really appreciate that recommendation. It's 13 years ago now since you made that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Representative. I would like to point out that your favorite uh, author, Mark Twain, is a good Missourian from the Show Me State who wrote his life about the Mississippi and our congressional district. So love to introduce, uh, recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our witnesses, thank you for your participation and your service to our uh, country. Uh, as the nation responded to the coronavirus pandemic, workers and families, as we all recall so painfully, stayed home in order to stay safe and to keep their families safe. Many lost their paychecks and their livelihoods virtually overnight through no fault of their own. My home state of Michigan, unemployment rose to 24% in April of 2020, just two months after former President Trump declared the health emergency. In response, uh, in, uninsur uh, unemployment insurance claims spiked at over 388,000 per week compared to the previous peak of 77,000 during the Great Recession. That's why, thankfully, Democrats and Republicans jointly acted swiftly to pass bipartisan legislation to get these unnecessary benefits in the hands of hardworking Americans as soon as they possibly could. Both parties came together to pass and extend these critical benefits through legislation such as the CARES Act. Now, looking at the continued economic growth that our country has had, these benefits did help millions of people, uh, preventing them from losing everything they've worked for and precipitating a larger crisis. The GAO has highlighted that these payments helped keep our economy afloat and improve the labor market. Unemployment insurance kept money in people's pockets and prevented our country from falling into much deeper economic demise. Now, some have argued that these benefits disincentivize workers and uh, are causing the labor shortage, despite uh, the fact that benefits expired in September of 2021. The latest jobs report obviously would indicate otherwise. Um, in February of 2023, the Department of Labor reported that unemployment was at 3.4 percent, the lowest since 1969. And I recognize the distinction when it comes to labor participation rates, but you just have to look at the data and see that labor participation rates are really less than a point off where they were three years ago uh, at, at what many would have considered to be uh, peak economic activity. Now, uh, 
The economy grew at 2.9% last quarter, more than 12 million new jobs created in just the last two years. Not only were these benefits good for the economy, they were a lifeline for workers when they most needed it. People were worried about putting food on the table, keeping a roof over their head, paying for basics like medicine. Uh, I would like to just mention, you know, this, these are human stories. I, my, my own constituents um, benefited from these important benefits, supported again by both sides of the aisle. Kathy and Timothy from Flint told me that the payments were hugely impactful. Timothy was a musician uh, at weddings and festivals and corporate events. Kathy's job in health insurance. Uh, they were able to, um, to provide and care for their oldest daughter as a result of these benefits. Timothy often worked nights to make sure that he did not have to hire a caregiver. Um, these benefits made a difference. People like Carla in Bay City, a self-employed cosmetologist, but due to the pandemic, she lost her main source of income. Without these benefits, she would have been in a very difficult position, would have lost everything she's worked for. Those are just a couple of the instances. And of course, we all know, all of us have had literally thousands of these cases come before us. No one, I think, ever should indicate that we think the system worked perfectly. We know of these difficulties. We know of the problems. And they're real, and they're serious, and absolutely have to be addressed. But I do think it's important that we not fall into the trap of somehow conflating the bipartisan decision that we all made to make sure that these benefits were quickly delivered to people at a time when in order to protect themselves, um, they, they had to stay home. Now there's a debate in some revisionist history about just how difficult those moments were. We didn't know what the future was going to be. Fast forward, a million Americans died. It would have been millions more had we not allowed people to make the decisions that they needed to do to protect themselves without having to lose everything that they've worked for. So let's pledge that we'll work to fix these problems. Let's pledge that we can come together to try to address these issues of fraud. The money was stolen, not just from the taxpayers, but actually from needed help to additional workers. Uh, we need to go after this, but let's not mistake, uh, make the mistake of somehow deciding we never should have done this in the first place. We never should have supplied this help. We certainly should have. And now we need to do what we can to make sure that we can reclaim the integrity and in the aspects of the program that actually failed. So with that, Mr. Chairman, thanks for holding this hearing. I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Uh, recognize the gentle lady from the state of Minnesota, Ms. Fishbach. The, the desks are so big, it's hard to reach. <laughs> Um, but uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I just think uh, Mr. Kilday had said a couple of the things about uh, about the dollars being stolen um, from the taxpayers, from the hardworking taxpayers. You know, way I think, and I think it bears saying it again and again where that money is coming from because uh, I think the Chair Smith had talked about uh, you know the hardworking families that this do these money came from, and um, I think it's important that we remember that while we're having these discussions. Uh, but um, I just wanted to, you know, um, ask a little bit, Mr. Turner. Your testimony notes the DOL provided 1.3 billion for states for UI modernization, um, including IT modernization. And of the funds spent, however, uh, states did not always take advantage of the opportunity to modernize their IT event uh, systems. Is that correct? That's correct. And do you know why that is? Why they didn't take advantage of it? Uh, in some cases, it was reported that some of these systems were so old that they did not really mesh well with the CARES Act in, in some case. But the, but the states that did use it show benefit from doing so. Well, so is, is there something more that we can use? I mean, so those dollars are still sitting there. Yeah, um, yes, yes, those dollars are still there. Let me just share with you, uh, uh, during the Recovery Act, there was $7 billion that was uh, dedicated for moder modernization, IT modernization. And of that, there was about $2 billion that was used for something other than that. Uh, and it was allowed at that time. But it was just shows you just uh, for some reason it has not been a priority for states when it comes to modernization. And that's one reason that we've paid the price that we have. 
So is the, do you think there's anything that we can do to encourage them to use those dollars so that we do modernize those? Well, I think one of the things the department is doing is, is with performance uh, measures that they're, they're using and keeping it as part of their top priorities. But I think uh, just more emphasis on that and continued emphasis will make a difference. Is there anything in um, that is attached to that money that would prevent them from using it now? I mean, or is it going to be brought, taken back or...? Well, uh, some of that, well, first of all, they've established a, a IT modern, modernization office, and I think part of that is going to help them provide the oversight that's needed by the department. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. I also wanted to uh, touch base with Mr. Dodaro about um, the, the, you've got uh, 10 points, and I know that we've talked a little bit about the legislature, or at least the proposals that you had, and I've, I've looked over the uh, 10 uh, um issues you had for congressional consideration. And I'm just wondering um, if you wanted to expand a little bit but uh, on some of those. But the other issue, I, if, if these had been enacted, um, what kind of reduction to the fraud do you think would have happened? I mean, would they have had a direct, um, a direct result of quitting, uh, stopping some of that? If, if effectively implemented, they would have had a material effect. I don't know exactly, I can't put a number on it. But for example, uh, the one recommendation that the uh, improper payment estimate be made in the first year of the program, mm -hmm. the PPP program uh, didn't estimate improper payments until 2022. The pandemic unemployment insurance program still hasn't, even though it's ended, it still doesn't have an improper payment estimate. If you had had estimates earlier, you would have been able to take more forceful actions and put things in place and compelled the states to, to focus on those issues earlier. You know, the anti-fraud strategy that we have in place in the uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, uh, they didn't designate an anti-fraud dedicated entity until February 2022, when the program was almost uh, finished. They didn't do a fraud risk assessment until 20, well into 21, almost the end of 21. The uh, uh, Labor Department still hasn't implemented the anti-fraud recommendations that we have to them. So a lot of these things would have had a, a good effect had they been put in place. That's why we're urging Congress to pass these legislative improvements. But I would say also to this committee, that unless there's sustained leadership attention at the Labor Department and effective working relationships with the states combined, combined with strong congressional oversight, these reforms won't be effectively implemented. Can, Thank you very much. Oh, and can, Mr. Can Horowitz, I add on, on to that? It not only would involve fraud prevention, but you'd have better delivery of service to the people who are entitled to the benefits, more prompt payment, reduction in identity theft, Think about how many people are dealing with identity theft mm -hmm. issues now as a result. All of those cascade from improving IT modernization, taking the steps that GAO has recommended. Thank you very much. And I have eight seconds, I will, or I went over, so I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member. Look, the work here we're doing is very important, and I believe our dialogue, while some differences, um, really has, spot, uh, has shown a spotlight on on our, our, our joint concern about fraud, right? And um, I appreciate, more importantly, the witnesses. We've all gotten the chance to get up and take a few meetings and a few breaks for, for, for sticking it out for a very long hearing. So thank you for that. Um, fortunately, so, so, so for some positive here, there are lessons that we can learn from states that have managed this very well. Uh, in Utah, where I, I represent, fraud over payments represented less than 1% of benefits paid. I'm incredibly proud of the work done by our former governor, Gary Herbert, Governor Spencer Cox, their administrations, and the Utah State Legislature to create systems and processes that protect taxpayer payer dollars. That, that is our most sacred responsibility, I believe, back here in, in, um, in this federal role. And uh, Congresswoman um, Spanberger and I have introduced the Preventing Improper Payments Act and uh, we're, which we've prepared following an excellent study by the GAO about how we can safeguard taxpayer dollars and prevent more waste, fraud, and abuse in the future. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record a report from the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee called Pandemic Unemployment, How Much Has Been Paid to Fraudsters? Without objection. Thank you. Um, this report is yet another demonstration of how, how much we don't know 
about the size and scope of this fraud. Many states have produced separate, re separate reviews on their own UI programs, and these reviews have sometimes included individual state estimates of fraud and improper payments. And up to 21 states, this report tracked, 21 states have reported approximately $58 billion in fraud estimates across these programs. And that's information that we have from less than, again, less than half of the states. So if state auditors are coming up with those large numbers, I do believe that the national estimate of 60 billion GAO reported is quite low. Um, Mr. Horowitz, I have a question for you. In these state reports, do we know how much of the funding identified as improper payments or fraud was federal dollars? So for several of the pandemic programs, it is federal dollars that flowed to the states. There were other parts of legislation enacted that um, were to fund and to support already existing state programs. So most of it's gonna be federal money. Some of it could be mixed in with state money. And as you indicated, what we, ident what we found was that the work of the state auditors was critical to this effort, but states were um, calculating fraud numbers in different ways. So I'd ha we'd have to go through state by state to break that down. Yeah, excellent. Uh, my, my, the gentleman from Oklahoma can highlight something that I think Utahns fill a lot of times. We, 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 we try to run things as responsible as we possibly can. I know there's a good faith estimate from a lot, but, but we, we do. Utahns all, all oftentimes feel like, why, why, if we're being so responsible and have the data to show some of this, why, why can't other states figure this out? It's a continual frustration and it's something that I hope to, to represent and shine a light on. Uh, my, under, my estimation, my understanding was in approximately 76% was federal dollars. So we're talking a, a total of close to, close to 700 billion. I mean, these are sizable numbers. These are deficit reducing opportunities for us, which is a, a huge um, responsibility of this committee is to be able to find ways to reduce deficits. There's, there's, there's significant bipartisan opportunity and we hope to be able to do that with this. We'll keep working on it. Um, do, you, do you get a sense how, to what level are you, are you um, confident that states are going after this money and recovering it? Um, I think a lot of the dialogue has moved in a positive direction over the last several years from the state workforce agencies in particular. Um, we're seeing a lot more effort to work together to do the kind of cross-border border work that needs to get done and interactions with state auditors because they are so central to this process and important. And Department of Labor's role, where would you, where, how would you describe or, or, or kind of like want to make sure that they, they, they do their role as much as possible? So I'm going to defer to the right. IG there on that. Please. Uh, repeat the question, please. Just to what, to what extent would you, would, you, would, you, would you put the Department of Labor responsible and involved in making sure that with states can, can go after and recover as much of these funds as possible? Oh, they are very responsible and involved. I think one of the things that they began to take advantage of is uh, what we've kind of requested before that uh, people uh, get more access, data access to the IG, OIG. And once that had began to happen, we began to see some improvement. Excellent. Um, there's another quick question to Mr. Turner actually about uh, entrepreneurs. And they were at, at risk of being targeted quite a bit for some of this fraud. And we wanna, we wanna, we wanna make sure that we're protecting that's, that side of it and, and, and making sure that those that are honest doing, doing the work that they need to do, they have that capability. Is there any rep measures you recommend to, to help implement, to prevent fraud without penalizing these entrepreneurs? Well, I'll be a little premature in speaking to that now because we actually have work going on to take a look at that. And then I should be to provide the committee something in the future. The whole point of this is to make sure we do this better, we shine the light, and, and keep working on it. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you for hanging in there. Uh, I'm so glad that we're holding a hearing on the unemployment system, which has long been neglected and underfunded by federal and state policymakers. I can tell you that like many of the colleagues here at the height of the pandemic, um, that's all we did was chase down unemployment insurance claims. I think, you know, and every story was distressing. Everyone was grimly similar that, that the enhanced UI payments were literally the only thing that allowed ordinary Americans who lost their work through no fault of their own to pay their bills, to buy groceries, to support their families. Um, we had myriad constituent cases, I think well over a thousand just in the first couple of months that, that we were wrestling in Virginia with an antiquated and overburdened state employment commission. And it just emphasized to me how important it was to have a program like this in a time of crisis. 
Uh, at the time, I was chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, uh, bipartisan, bicameral, um, a great honor. And one of the things we did was talk to the smartest economists across the board, Democrat, Republican, you know, conservative, liberal, uh, about what to do. And everyone started with the unemployment insurance system and the enhanced unemployment. It became really clear that this work um, was essential to the recovery. You know, you've heard you showed through many different witnesses that no other country in the world has recovered as quickly from the pandemic economically as have we, with still a ways to go. UI kept millions of Americans out of poverty, it saved countless jobs, and prevented home foreclosures, which obviously destroyed us in 2008, 2009, and it set the stage for this historically low unemployment, 54 years, steady GDP growth, and uh, although there's still a ways to go, slowing inflation. Every Thursday at five o'clock, um, the governor of Virginia held a conference call with all the Democratic and Republican members of the Virginia delegation. So Morgan Griffith from Southwest Virginia to, to Tim Kaine. And we each got our three or four minutes with the governor and virtually every conversation was about the broken UI system. And he would have to explain that in Richmond, it, the software was from 1980, the um, codes were nobody knew anymore and the hardware was from 1980. And that they were doing the best they could with, but they had not, you know, in January of 2020, they hadn't expected the incredible deluge that they had. So one of, right away, we tried to go to, to work and say, look, let's, um, as we're handing money out, let's make sure that we're giving a lot of money to the states Democratic and Republican-led states to invest in the UI system so that if this ever happens again, um, we, we can be ready. So, so Mr. Turner, um, softball question. Would investing in highly trained state UI staff and better computer systems help prevent the fraud that we were talking about today and ensure that the benefits are paid on time? Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, that's something that we've included in our recommendations in the past. That's a very short answer, thank you. That's about the shortest I've heard in my four years on Ways and Means. Um, Mr. Horowitz, a similar question. Um, and you mentioned that multiple states experienced issues verifying eligibility for benefits. That was a huge one for us. People would be ruled ineligible and it would take them weeks or months to be able to prove their eligibility. Um, and long delays because of that. One of the things we provided in the American Rescue Plan, which half of us like, was up grading antiquated state UI computer systems. How important is that investment for, for the fraud that we're talking about? Um, it's critical. Uh, the states, as you indicated, the, the situation with Virginia, it's not alone. It's a problem across the country. States need to upgrade their IT systems. They're, they're, we have moved um, light years in just the last several years on the ability to do verification, identity verification. And so systems has to have to catch up. Great, great. Well, I, I still have a minute left, which I will yield back. And I want to thank you for showing up and for helping us uh, get our hands around this, balancing both the need to preserve every possible taxpayer dollar from, from fraud, but also making sure that we are supporting the American citizens who look to us. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Recognize the gentlelady from the state of California, Ms. Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here today and all, for all the work you have done to shine a spotlight on these important issues. Today's hearing is about fraud, and this lost funds actually came from hardworking taxpayers, and it should not happen again. Last Congress, I led an effort to recover funds, prevent fraud, and support the victims on, of unemployment fraud identity theft. Along with Speaker McCarthy, I introduced the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Fraud Protection Act. My bill would create an incentive structure to encourage states to recover fraudulent unemployment payments, require states to revamp and improve fraud prevention efforts in the unemployment program, and include necessary protection for victims, those innocent taxpayers will receive 1099K without receiving these employment payments of unemployment benefits fraud. My constituents, Californians, and Americans who actually need unemployment assistance should be the ones who receive it, not criminals. California was one of the biggest targets for this fraud. The state of California legislative analysis, 
analysis office reported that $18.7 billion, 94% of unemployment insurance benefit fraud may have occurred in the federally funded unemployment program. An estimated $20 billion in potentially fraudulent unemployment payments are still under investigation. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record for a report by California State Auditor issued in January 2021. Without objection. This report found significant weaknesses in the Employment Development Department's approach to fraud prevention, which led to billions of dollars in improper benefit payments. According to the report, EDD paid $1 billion of $11 billion in part two to a problematic decision to streamline its process by removing a safeguard against paying individuals with unconfirmed identities. EDD, which was led by current Department of Labor Deputy Secretary Julie Su, issued the payments to those claimants with unconfirmed identities before discovering it had removed the safeguards for more than a four month period. And believe it or not, she was just named as an acting secretary of the Department of Labor, somebody who messed up in California EDD programs. California made it easy for fraudsters access benefits and that had devastating consequences for my constituents. We should all be on the side of good governance and protection of taxpayer money and the billions in fraud paid out over the last two years is an embarrassment. Mr. Turner, last October, your agency issued a report <coughs> finding that nearly half of the pandemic unemployment benefits may have been improperly paid with one in five dollars going to fraudsters. California was one of the four states you looked at. One of the things your report looked at was timeliness of the payments. I shared concerns voiced by my friends on the other side of the aisle about ensuring equity and access to benefits. That doesn't mean we should prioritize speed over safeguards just to get money out the door quickly. California stories show how unfair and unjust the consequences can be for taxpayers and workers. Mr. Turner, can you talk about best practices and what needs to be done to modernize systems to ensure states have the proper verification up front? Yes, and thanks for the question. I think one of the things that we don't do enough and utilize enough is, is, is data analytics. Uh, data analytics uh, has helped us. It's been a game changer and a force multiplier. And it was one of the things that uh, allowed us to identify the 45.6 billion uh, in fraud from those four high risk areas that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so that's one thing. I think also maybe we need to go look at probably uh, a central database. One of the things that helped this fraud get perpetrated was the fact that uh, Every state, all 53 states or entities operate different systems. So therefore, what's not enough cross-checking to basically uh, catch some of that fraud early on. So how are you going to make it easy between California, especially California is the highest amount, that fraudulent amount that you know we found out. So how are you going to work with the state and federal government? Well, uh, you, uh, just uh, giving guidance from our reports and, um, as far as what needs to be, be done to be improved, I think that's a big start and just uh, uh, emphasizing uh, rec working together and coming up with maybe one system. Because right now, the biggest challenge for the OIG is data access. And so, uh, and that's what I believe uh, slowed us down in identifying some of this fraud earlier. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Representative. I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Van Dyne from the great state of Texas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you um, for holding this hearing as well. As my colleagues have already alluded to, this hearing is long overdue. It's entirely unacceptable that it took a change in control of Congress to investigate the greatest theft of taxpayer dollars the United States has ever seen. And yet, this administration has not shown an ounce of care. Behind me, I want you to look at the estimates 
of immensely irresponsible amounts of fraud and improper payments. The fact that the Biden administration can turn a blind eye to this dire level of fraud raises questions that there is no end in sight. OMB estimates an appalling $104 billion of potential fraud. Let's put that into perspective because we've been throwing out numbers like they don't mean anything. $104 billion, that is a level of spending that is equal to the entire budget of the Department of Veterans Affairs, the entire budget. But it's also thought by a number of professional auditing agencies that that number's worse. It's four times that amount. It's up to $400 billion. And not only is this the greatest theft of taxpayer money, but it's borderline criminal and certainly pure incompetency. The oversight of this money is an absolute dumpster fire being put out by a fireman with a garden hose. Mr. Turner, you mentioned that you'd sent correspondence to the Trump administration about some of these concerns. Have you also sent correspondence communications to the Biden administration? Yes, we have. Do you think, do you have any reason to suspect that there was fraud, abuse, potential outlayings of dollars that were improper after January 20th of 2021? Uh, yes, there, there was. I appreciate you saying that because I think members on the other side of this aisle need to hear that. We have, in the last two years, experienced a lot of fraud. We're talking about $400 billion that to the people that they claim that they want to help, that dollars could have gone in, into, those, into those pocketbooks. We just released... Just because they're, they're saying that this happened under the Trump administration does not release Congress from its duty to be able to protect those dollars. We have to admit that there have been problems under both administrations, right? We can't just stick our head in the sand and blame Trump for everything and pretend like we, we heard last night that everything under this administration is rosy and perfect. We had an opportunity right now today to have an honest discussion. You would assume that getting down to fraud and abuse in saving taxpayer dollars for those people who need it the most would be a bipartisan effort. All of you are well-versed. You've done a tremendous amount of investigation. You've got solutions on the table that you wanna to present to us today. But instead, we're hearing about the, the witnesses who aren't here, the stories of people who've used unemployment. We understand it was used. It was used by people who needed it the most. But we also understand up to $400 billion was misused, and we need to get down to that. And I've got some questions. I know uh, during my time on small business that there were issues with PPP and IDLE, and we thought those dollars were being spent overseas illegally. Do we know how much money went to international organizations and foreign actors? Do we know if this money fell into the hands of terrorist organizations? And can we track how much money actually went overseas? And probably the biggest question I've got for any of you, do we have any hope of ever seeing these dollars again? Mr. Daughter? Uh, history will tell us that there will be a very low percentage that would likely be recovered from fraud. And that, and that is just the fact of the matter. Mr. Turner? I would agree. And let me just say, uh, it will, it's going to take a while. As you know, that a lot of the, the fraud is still out there. We still have 162 open investigations that we haven't looked at. And so it's going to actually take quite a while to ever figure out exactly how much. Mr. Horowitz? Um, the recovery rate is clearly going to be far below what the fraud rate is. Having said that, the public should know we're going to do everything we can in our powers to try and track down and find every dollar. And Congress has given us tools to do that. We're asking for some more, um, and we're going to do everything we can. We're going to also, by the way, use suspension and debarment authorities and others to try and make sure the crime doesn't pay to the best extent possible we're able to do it. Do you think it's, 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 it's important to us that we start that as soon as possible and not have kind of this political theater? Oh, absolutely. Look, this is, and we're doing it. We've been doing it for three years, and we're going to keep doing it. I appreciate that answer. Thank you very much, and I yield back. I want to thank the gentlelady who recognized the gentleman from um, Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my comments will be to the point. First, I want to thank the ranking member for what he has said, because I believe he has summed it up 
And when you talk about just the facts, that's what I believe that it should come down to. That's where I believe that we are. So I encourage my colleagues to consider these distressed constituents and remember that unemployment insurance saved the economy and kept families out of poverty. So I believe that what he said, he summed it up. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Finstra. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman Smith. Uh, thank you also uh, to each of our witnesses for your testimony. I greatly appreciate it. Obviously, we've talked about you know, what has happened at the height of the pandemic with 15.4% uh, unemployment, 23 million people unemployed. Uh, the circumstances obviously demanded a, a, a resolution, and, and we did that. But with that, it created risk, and now we are responsible. We're responsible for oversight of the risk that incurred in giving these unemployment benefits. Uh, what's interesting to me is uh, that we never had oversight or never had hearings in the 117th Congress, despite the warnings that were noted last March from the Department of Labor that we had $163 billion of improper payments. So I am grateful, I'm very grateful, and thank Chairman Smith for holding this hearing. And I also want to thank you again as witnesses uh, for doing so and being part of this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dodaro, it's very important, I think, that we continue to assess the exact scale of the problem. I mean, we really need to know the exact scale. And I know you've been working on that. I great, greatly appreciate it. The GO, uh, A's rep or GAO's report last, uh, last month noted that this is a little difficult concerning the false positives and false negatives. We're not sure. Uh, also due to the lack of consistent and reliable estimates that cover all UI payments during the pandemic, pandemic it's not currently possible to combine existing estimates and measures to make a meaningful statement about the extent of fraud and UI programs during the pandemic. So in your testimony, uh, you noted GAO has committed to build on existing evidence with its own modeling to calculate a more precise estimate. Can you, can you talk about that? How do, we, how do we refine our estimate and what would be the barriers in refining that estimate? Well, first, uh, the Labor Department for a number of years has what's called uh, the, um, the acronym is BAM, uh, Benefit Accuracy Measurement Program. So they estimate a national fraud rate and a national improper payment rate. Yep. So far, they've not measured the improper payment rate for the Pandemic Unemployment Insurance Program. That was the one for self-employed people, a brand new program. We all think that the rate, fraud rate's higher for that program than probably the more traditional unemployment insurance program because there was allow for self-certification rate. So what we're trying to do is to look at uh, that program in particular. We'll see what the Labor Department comes up with their estimate, which is due this year, and then we'll do some sampling of that particular program we're going to look and do some modeling of other areas. So we're going to take a modeling approach. We're also going to try to sample some of the estimates. Yep. And it's important to remember that our estimate of 60 billion is is the low end. Correct. We've said that that's a low end. We're working on a higher rate so, now. So when do you think you can have a more accurate number? At what point? I mentioned earlier, late this summer. Late this, okay, late this summer. Late this okay. summer. If we do it earlier, I'll obviously okay. let you know. Yep. But I think it's important to it note that there are a lot of numbers out there, yep. but they're all bad. <laughs> I hear you. An accurate number would be wonderful. I, I, then we know what we're dealing with, right? So another question. So I come, I was chair of Ways and Means. I handled uh, unemployment the tax tables and stuff like that, understanding the, the nuances of, of unemployment tax. Um, so when I look at empowering state auditors, I really think we can do this. I think we can use state auditors, but we got to empower them. So uh, Dodaro and even Mr. Turner, what are your ideas to empower them? Because they're just not going to say, oh, I'm going to do this, right? I mean, they could care less about the federal government. It's like, but we can do things to empower them. What, what is your thoughts on that? I think we should have specific audit requirements for state auditors to look at the unemployment insurance program and the Medicaid program. 
These are two programs on our high risk list. Medicaid is one of the fastest growing programs. Right now, there's hardly any auditing done of the managed care portion of right. Medicaid. But, but do they care? I mean, I look at the state going, and they're, I mean, I, I, we use our tables, and it's like, what do we care about? Why, why should I do this for the federal government? I mean, well, but I think in both of those programs, states provide their own money. Yeah, yeah, right. For, 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 you know, and, and so there's some incentives for them. I mean, the Medicaid program is probably a, a, a third of each state's budget, right, at right, least, right. in the program. So do you think that's enough carrot? I, I mean, I just. Well, all you got to do is turn an auditor to loose, and you give them some money to pay. There's for, the key. You hit it on yeah. the head. You give them a little incentive of money, right. don't you, you know, think? You have to. You have to provide support. Now, right yes. now, there's single audits that are done by state auditors. Yes. Uh, but they don't focus enough on the detailed aspects of fraud, mismanagement. They're, they're a starting point yes. for accountability, but they're not the answer. No. No. I want to thank you for that. I just want a quick note. I mean, when you work in business, you, you, you pay people to collect, collect debt. Eh, that might be a clue for our, for our state auditors and for the federal government. Thank you, and I yield back. I think the representative would like to recognize the gentle lady from the state of New York, Ms. Mali Otakis. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, it was very informative. And we've heard today of the massive figures of improper unemployment payments, many fraudulent, which could be as high as $400 billion, some of which could have been prevented if we had put in the proper guardrails in place, in, particularly in the last $1.9 uh, trillion American rescue plan that the Democrats jammed through. Um, my home state of New York, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, ranks near the top of the list with an estimated $11 billion in fraudulent unemployment payments, I mean, pay payments alone. These taxpayer dollars went to fraudsters, many uh, who are from overseas, as far away as China and Russia and Nigeria, uh, who bought luxury cars, condos, watches, designer goods. As you could see, I made a nice graph here because we haven't talked about that today. It's shocking to my constituents when we tell them that this pandemic relief money shamefully went to purchase 18 karat Rolex watches, luxury condominiums, Louis Vuitton uh, and, and other designer goods, a $10 million villa in the Dominican Republic, $3.5 million mansion in New Jersey, chartered jet services, luxury vehicles from Porsches to Mercedes Benz to Ferraris uh, to Bentleys, um, one person even received $1.5 million over a span in 10 months. This is absolutely unacceptable, and I'm glad to hear today that there's bipartisan support to crack down on this, and we must do what we can to recoup this money. Uh, but to make matters worse, my district offices in Staten Island and Brooklyn worked with dozens of constituents who have had their identities stolen and could not get the unemployment benefits that they desperately needed. Um, because the Department of Labor in New York failed to prevent fraud at the outset of the pandemic, the unemployment insurance trust fund was drained. And for the last two years, the state has had an outstanding loan to the tune of $8 billion from the federal government. My colleague uh, mentioned this earlier. I'm concerned that New York small business is gonna be left holding the bag. And my question, uh, if you can clarify, if New York continues to fail to repay its federal advance due to its failure to limit this fraud, uh, will their per worker tax keep increasing year after year and by how much? I can provide an answer for the record for it, but I would say offhand uh, that that that's up to the state to decide how to repay the money. Now, some of the pandemic money was available for states to use to repay their money that they owed to the unemployment insurance program. So I, I even think there's money, you know, in the coronavirus relief fund that was given $350 billion to the states. I believe, don't hold me precisely to this, but my memory serves me right, some of that money could be used to help repay the program. So it depends on the decisions made by the governors and the state legislatures on how to repay that money. Well, that's a good point, and it's about $100 billion that is unspent in COVID relief funds, so perhaps uh, the federal government can take action there. Uh, which states did, did it right? Okay, New York obviously did it wrong. Uh, my colleague 
talked about his state of Utah, uh, that they had good preventive measures in place. What states, Mr. Horowitz, do you think are model states that we should be looking at on how to prevent this type of fraud? Um, what, what we've seen are evolving actions by the states over the last several years. Um, and so what I want to do is get back to you on sort of which ones perhaps are leading the effort. There are several, though, as part of the National Association of State Workforce Agencies that have come together to, for example, implement uh, uh, identification verification, identity verification tools mm -hmm. uh, that have been very important because you mentioned identity theft. Mm -hmm. We at the PRAC often talk about identity theft creating three victims. There's the public at large because it's the public's program that gets the money stolen from. There's obviously the person whose identity is stolen who has credit issues, other issues they've got to deal with. But then there's the person, as you mentioned, who was the intended beneficiary. And we've heard testimony about individuals, as you said, who went to get benefits, whether it's from unemployment insurance or other programs, and were turned down because the agencies thought they were the fraudsters. No, the I appreciate that. fraudster beat them there. And I, pre uh, I want to just 20 seconds left with on that point. Mr. Dorado, your testimony notes that of uh, October 2022, there have been 41 states using the identity verification service that provides new um, data sets to conduct enhanced unemployment claimant identity verification, as was discussed here, and contains cross-matching with uh, Social Security, uh, the death master file, to identify the use of deceased persons. Um, can you please talk about that? Why are and should all states be using this service, number one? And do we have an estimate of how many dead people received unemployment benefits? I don't know if Mr. Horowitz knows that or, or Mr. Turner, but I, I don't have the estimate for the total number. But I do know that it's an appropriate cross match to make. You know, one of the easiest targets for fraudsters is to get a Social Security number from a deceased individual. A lot of this information, as Mr. Turner mentioned earlier, is on the dark web, and they can do that. I, I know my own mother received, uh, she passed away, unfortunately right before the pandemic. So she received an economic incentive payment from the Treasury Department. Now my sister returned it because uh, she called me and said, what to do? I said, send it back. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, tr Treasury, th this is a problem with the federal government too. Treasury sent $1.4 billion to an estimated 1.2 deceased individuals in the economic incentive programs. Now due to our recommendation, I got about half of that back. It's so about $700 million. The, the, right now, the Treasury Department Fiscal Service is not allowed, is not allowed to use the Social Security full desk master file to check before they make a federal payment. Now, that's something I've been trying to get for years. Congress finally passed it. It's due to take effect next year around this time, but I think it should be expedited and it made permanent on a basis. I mean, there's no reason that we should be doing this. Uh, yes, if I could add, uh, on that, uh, the deaf, uh, social security numbers of deaf individuals, uh, we do have that available. I don't have it broken down for me right now, but we can provide to you, that to you at a later time after, after the Thank you. Hearing. I'm sure everyone on the committee would like to know that. Yes, we can provide that. that. Thank you. And we will, Thank you know, work to get that data. But, but I would say just picking up on um, Mr. Jadara's comment, we, on our fraud alert we just released, when we matched PPP and EIDL information with the Social Security Administration, we have several thousand deceased individuals who got PPP and EIDL loans. Our job now is we're trying to figure out if they were alive at the time of application. Mm -hmm. Our guess is some were. Our guess is many weren't because we've seen this problem and it makes no sense why you would want the Social Security Administration to have a death master file index and yet let other parts of the federal government pay out billions of dollars in benefits to individuals who are deceased. Thank you, Representative. We'll now recognize the gentleman from um, Illinois, Mr. Schneiders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and let me start with the obvious. Everyone on this committee is outraged at the rampant fraud experienced during the pandemic. American taxpayers, including as was touched on, those who relied on the program stood up by this Congress, and by the way, stood up unanimously by Republicans and Democrats together, were victimized by deceitful individuals and organized criminal groups. No one's defending it. We all agree that we should be doing everything possible to recover the money stolen and prosecute those who stole the money to the full extent of the law. 
We also need to make sure that going forward, we're better at defending against fraud, from program design to system development, supporting the programs, and deterring those inclined to consider stealing from taxpayers with greater prosecution and enhanced recovery. And let's review the facts. Three years ago, our nation faced an unprecedented health and economic crisis. In February of that year, we sat in this very room with Secretary Azar. And I'd venture to say that no one sitting here had any idea of the devastating impact the pan pandemic would have. We had a much better view a month later when we came back to D.C. and passed the CARES Act, bipartisan, unanimous. And then 20 million people lost their jobs. Unemployment reached nearly 15 percent, and that's the highest rate since the Great Depression, and there was no end in sight. Now let's consider what would have happened if Congress had not acted. Maybe another Great Depression. The loss not just of individual businesses, but of entire industries and millions of people out of work with no prospect of finding a new job. Rising poverty across the country and negative economic and social impact lasting for generations. So some like charts, I love analogies. We had a five alarm fire raging out of control. We were trying to put that fire out with water passed in buckets as fast as possible. And the buckets had holes. Speed mattered, as we've discussed, which meant that there was a trade-off between trying to fix the holes and precisely passing the buckets so no water spilt, and getting the water as quickly and effectively as possible to the fire lines. And unfortunately, that would mean not getting 100% of the water to the flames. Does anyone here want to claim we failed at our primary goal of putting out the fire? Are you asserting that the millions of Americans out of work at the time and otherwise unable to feed their families or keep roofs over their heads didn't receive desperately needed assistance? Is anyone arguing that we should not have stood up these programs? Last month, this economy created more than 500,000 jobs, 12 million jobs just in the past two years, and employment, as also has been noted today, is at its lowest rate in 54 years. So my questions to our panel, as we've discussed today, the breadth and sophistication of the many unemployment insurance fraud schemes and the ongoing efforts to pursue criminals and reclaim the monies, and with an eye towards making sure that we're better prepared if we face a similar crisis, what should have or could have Congress and the Trump administration done in 2020 to better protect against fraudulent claims, and what should we be doing now? And I'll start with you, Mr. Dodaro. Yes. Uh, first, uh, the legislation that Congress passed in 2016 was to get agencies prepared to prevent fraud. That needs to be effectively implemented. It's still not effectively implemented at the Labor Department or at the Small Business Administration and others. So we're slightly better prepared than we were before, but we're not fully prepared for the next emergency. So that, to use your analogy, that, you know, we, we save you know, the fire doesn't do as much damage as it does before we put it out, in it, all right? And so, uh, secondly, there needs to be more oversight by the Congress to make sure agencies put these anti-fraud prevention measures in place and deal with improper payments. Since 2003, when agencies have been re uh, required to report improper payments, there's been $2.4 trillion in improper payments. This is a problem that's pervasive across the government. It, last year, 86 programs, 16 different agencies. More attention needs to be put on these two matters. Great. Thank you. Mr. Turner. For us, I would say data access. And Labor OIG had data access from the start. Instead of having to wait five or six months to get it, we would have been able to move out and identify some of these issues a lot earlier. So for us, that would be the key. And although the department has gotten better with that, uh, they are assisting us. But it's temporary solution that we have in, 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 a, in, pl in, a, in place right now. And so we hope uh, that we can get something more permanent, but we would hate to resort back to uh, uh, ID subpoenas. Okay. Mr. Horowitz. Um, IT modernization, um, what uh, Mr. Dodaro said on that. Um, transparency, greater transparency into data. Um, Justice Brandeis famously said, sunlight is the best of disinfectants. Get that information out. We need it. The IG needs it. Um, and third, data analytics, ability to cross-match data. One person shouldn't be able to take their Social Security number to 40-plus states to get benefits. Thank you. And if I can quote my friend, Mr. Kelly, we shouldn't be pointing fingers. Let's find a way to work together and solve this problem, make sure we don't face a crisis like this again. I yield back. Thank you, Representative. 
want to highlight again the purpose of this hearing um, is to investigate the size and scope of fraud in the federal unemployment program, which more than doubled in the last few years um, during the pandemic. The purpose is to investigate fraud. Uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, the, recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kerry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I want to thank the witnesses for your time uh, and your patience with, with all the questions you're getting asked. We highlighted, I think, throughout uh, today the importance that state auditors have in, um, across, the, across the country. To that end, um, Keith Faber, who is our state auditor, actually issued a, a report, um, and in it, in the, which I will be and eventually putting it to the record, Ohio estimated is estimated, estimated to have paid over a billion in fraudulent, un, fraudulent unemployment benefits from March 2020 to 2022. And I think my colleague from Ohio highlighted the fact that both our governor, our lieutenant governor, and our governor's wife each received the, the, the fraudulent claims. Um, the other thing that the auditor's report identified, which I found interesting, was it identified over 475 million was actually paid to criminals. So, Mr. Chairman, without objection, I'd like to submit this for the record. Without objection. So I'm gonna go into, uh, I'm gonna kind of go through my question laid out. Last February, uh, the administration took unilateral action to sweep suspected fraud under the rug, releasing guidance to allow states to waive large numbers of suspicious claims and forego recovery and restitution for the taxpayers. Then in March, DOL reported that the states identified $35.1 billion in overpayments made in the UI programs during the first seven quarters of the pandemic. So after first allowing the states to waive the overpayments and only subsequently identifying the extent of the overpayments, DOL relented last July and sent $250 million to the states for reporting and detection and recovery of the overpayments. While DOL is not here, to address, to address these contrary actions, perhaps DOL OIG can shed some light on this. So uh, with that, and Mr. Turner, I do believe you were in the military for a number of years? Uh, yes, I was. I want to thank you for your service. Um, so Mr. Turner, even if DOL told states they could not waive fraudulent payments, how are we to know what some claims involved in those waivers were not fraud if the states don't have to look into them at all. Well, you've kind of taken the uh, OIG position okay. because you, we actually believe that you do have to do that. And part of our work uh, this year, this spring, is going to take a look at that. Wonderful. And, and to that, are you investigating the impact of this guidance on your ability to recover fraudulent payments? Yes, we are. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. And last but certainly not least, the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I will try to be quick. Um, obviously, starting with the CARES Act, Congress acted with speed and bipartisanship to help people who lost their livelihoods, who lost money, who lost their jobs. We provided billions for unemployment insurance that worked, that helped people, that actually prevented hardship for millions, including in my district, the 19th Congressional in California. Now, unfortunately, as we've heard over and over, and as we know well, there was fraud. And as a former prosecutor, I'm well aware of people who try to pull, one's, oh, pull one over on the federal government and on the government. And yes, we should hold them accountable to the fullest extent of the law, as we've been hearing throughout today's hearing. But now, as a federal representative, I get to look forward. And basically, we get to create laws or provide funding to help eliminate, to help prevent fraud. That's why through the American Rescue Plan, we in Congress provided that type of significant funding for oversight and improvements for our unemployment insurance systems. Now, Mr. Horowitz, earlier, I think you mentioned, you know, that's exactly what we're doing and have been doing right now. And so my question to you is, did that funding help crack down on fraud during the pandemic? And will it help states in the future protect from fraud? So the funding did help states make a start in this effort. Um, I think there's more that needs to be done, as GAO has reported on and DOL OIG has reported on. Um, but the extent to which you modernize and improve the systems, you not only 
reduce the rate of fraud, but you improve the benefit. You, you improve the delivery of benefits that people are entitled to get the benefits. Do you have any examples of states that are modernizing uh, with this funding, their unemployment systems, and are there any lessons learned looking at any particular states? There, there are multiple states, actually, that are moving forward. So I'm not going to single any out, but they're working through their national association to do that. Um, and I, I would say the key um, movement forward is modernizing their systems and taking steps to do identity verification. So there is a, a variety of tools being tested in, in among the states, um, but it, th that to, to me, from what I've seen so far, not just, by the way, with unemployment insurance, with SBA as well, and, and other federal programs, the need to put in place identity verification. Understood. And then um, just let me throw this out there. Would it help if there was a national standard for unemployment systems when it comes to maybe, and I think you guys have mentioned this, technology, data gathering, or in order to help states set up systems for employing unemployment insurance? You know, I, I think that is an excellent question, Congressman, and a key question for Congress. And because we have largely built a unemployment insurance system that's that's managed effectively at the state level, 54 entities, the 50 states, DC and, and territories. Um, and the question is, how much do you want to centralize it? How much do you want to give authority to the Labor Department to manage those systems? And I know GAO has written on that and spoken about that as well. It's, it's a policy question, um, really, for the Congress to consider. Mr. Dodaro? I, I think it would be a good idea to have some that minimum national standards. You don't want to hamstring yeah. the states sure. from being innovative and trying different approaches because that could be beneficial. But you have to have some minimum standards that are in place, particularly for IT systems, particularly if you want those systems to be able to talk one another and to have be able to cross match. As we've been pointed out this morning, if somebody files a claim, uh, you know, in one state, they can file in all the other states and nobody would know the difference because there's no way to cross compare. There ought to be cross comparisons against incarcerated people as well. Uh, there's a system that's kept for that as well. Uh, unless there are standards, uh, you're not ever going to have the optimum IT systems network nationally to deal with a global problem like we had before. Great. Mr. Turner, anything on a national, uh, an, uh, a national standard? Only thing that I can say to add is that I think there need to be a, some kind of central database that the OIG has direct access to as well as the department and the states. Great. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I would like to thank our witnesses for, uh, for being here the whole time and for the great discussion. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered. Later in writing, those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the committee stands adjourned.